This is Have You Met? My guest today is a legend of exploration. In 1998, he left his home in the UK to begin the epic Goliath expedition. Originally a 12 year plan to walk around the world, 23 years and countless stories later, he's still going. The Goliath expedition has two rules. One, he can only travel on foot. Two, he won't return home to the UK until he walks there. During his already 30,000 plus mile stroll, he's taken on some of the most challenging and dangerous feats possible. Have you met Carl Bushby? So Carl, tell me your origin story. Talk to me a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing, and kind of how that set you on a path to go to the military. I think it was all pretty normal. Um, decent family. Um, the family kind of split up when I was young, unfortunately. But um, I come from basically a military family uh, at, the, at its roots. Grandfather, great-grandfather, uh, myself, my father, uh, my brother, my half-brother were all in uniform. Um, and most of them lifelong soldiers as well. Uh, certainly my father was, who was a huge influence in my life, me and my brother. So I, I joined the army at a very young age. Um, school life was an absolute disaster. Uh, and um, I, I left school at uh, 15, 16. Uh, sorry, left, the, left school at 15, joined the army at 16 as a boy soldier um, into the parachute regiment. It was preordained. Um, I think both me and my brother, um, my father had actually, I think he told my mother at one point that one of us was going to become Coldstream Guards because that was like a family tradition. And the other one was going to be a paratrooper um, before we were a year old. And then that's precisely what he got. Uh, oh, really? I certainly don't remember exactly what he got. So I don't, I don't remember any kind of coercion, any you know heavy coercion, but... Um, it all just fell into place. Yeah. Uh, I think by the by the time I was in my early teens, then I started looking at the army, uh, and my education was so bad that I probably didn't have much of a choice at that point, to be honest. So, um, <laughs> but no, I, I yeah, by the time I was by the time I was leaving school, my my lifelong ambition was to die on a foreign battlefield with my boots on for Queen and country. I was wow. well and truly indoctrinated. That was the real deal. Fully bought in. Yeah. Wow. That yeah, is the real yeah, deal. Yeah, absolutely. So you were, yeah, 15, 16 when you're feeling like that. And, and how did you how did you actually like, apply to the paratroopers? Is there a stage of military you have to go through first to get there? Or is it just, it's just, just direct you just, off the street? You just, yeah, you just head down to the cruise office and say, I want to, you know, parachute regiment. Now, obviously, the standards in the parachute regiment were somewhat higher. Because they're the only, um, you know, British Army outside of special forces that um, have, uh, you know, a physical selection course. Uh, you join them because they're one of the elite units. Um, and certainly, mm -hmm. with my my father's career was, you know, he was he was a paratrooper. You know, he started off coaching guns, but became a paratrooper, and then eventually ended up spending um, twelve years in the SAS. So it's all wow. very, you know, that that was supposedly the the route that we were all supposed to go. Uh, mm. But uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't built for that. Yeah. So your father, he was a big, tall, like a uh, strong, everything like that. Right. The, the stereotypical yeah, kind he, of special he, forces. He was your average comic book hero. Yeah. Six foot three and just, you know, built like it. Yeah. yeah. And then you, what were you like at 16? What was your kind of frame and figure? Um, like like a uh, a toothpick, <laughs> and at sixteen I looked six, um, so it was hard to convince anybody that I was going anywhere in the army. Um, and I I was physically immature, so I I really didn't have what was physically required. But what I had was plenty of uh, was plenty of will. Um, being someone who rationalised. That whose life was supposed to end, end on a battlefield somewhere. Um, I was willing to give everything I could give to get to that point. So I, I, I ended up spending something like uh, almost two years in recruit company, which at the time in the parachute regiment was, was pretty rare. And I ended up doing um, five selection, uh, what they call P company, which is this uh, selection 
physical selection process. It's a week long um, physical nightmare. Um, so what's involved in that week? It's it's just a back to back series of episodes of physical tests. Everything from all kinds mm. of um, short endurance obstacle races, runs, even a bit of milling, a bit of boxing, um, where you're always being judged to see if you have what it takes. And then there's a lot of long distance endurance marches, speed marches, and it just keeps going. And it's all done under a very, very high pressure environment to really just knock the shit out of you for a week. Mm. And at the time, you know, back then, it was like a, it was a 90% failure rate. Like there wasn't that many of you would get through. Um, and then once you got beyond that and you, you, you proved you had an, what it took to be able to then you go into the advanced basic training and parachute training and all that kind of thing. But that, that mm. was like a you know, real war. And uh, it took me five attempts, which at the time was absolutely unprecedented. Like no one had ever yeah. been allowed five attempts. You, you get one, you get two, some might even get three, but normally they wouldn't, they wouldn't give you another chance. If you just can't do it, you can't do it. But um, I was an extremely keen young soldier. I, I just wouldn't give up. I, would, I was there every day. Um, and, you know, I had some fans in the training staff that were willing to cut me some slack. Yeah. Uh, and um, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, I think it was a mixed blessing. It wasn't definitely all good. It wasn't a good thing for me personally, I don't think, because it left me with a, a stigma. And I think I had a, always had something to prove after that because I was mm. maybe considered the weak link in a, a very tight regiment, uh, a unit that doesn't, you know. I remember the first day I arrived in junior parachute regiment um, and above the door, the banner simply read, you know, the strong shall live, the weak shall die. And that's pretty much the philosophy all the way through. There's absolutely no mercy. Yeah. You can't cut it, you know, you're out. So it's pretty rare that someone will be given that kind of a chance. Um, but like I said, it was a, it was a, a double edged weapon. It kind of went both ways. Um, you know, I think a lot of people held it against me where some people might yeah. have, you know, pointed at me and said, well, look, this guy is just, they'll try until he dies kind of thing, which yeah. is something. And of course, yeah, you know, definitely. I've spent some time in the regiment. I was able to meet grade and I could, I could pass the test, but I always struggled. Physically, I always struggled because I was just, there was nothing, nothing on me at whatsoever. Mm. I was so freaking small. And then, but yeah. eventually, and, and, you know, they let me in because they, they said, look, he's got everything that we're looking for. Physically, he'll develop. So, um, but man, it was brutal. It was. Uh, so did you feel like in the, in the end, did you feel like on that fifth, uh, fifth shot at P Company, did you th feel like they gave you a kind of, maybe not a free pass, but did you feel like you weren't sure if you'd hit what they were actually looking for and maybe yeah. it kind of left you with a doubt like as to whether either you would actually made it and, and, but you weren't convinced you had, or on the other hand, they kind of bumped, like it kind of helped you out a little bit because they were so convinced that you were, a, you know, the, the right stuff. Um, but I guess it left you in some kind of weird limbo. Yeah. Where like in a way it would have been better for them to it was... let you have another go. It, it was bad. It was bad to some degree because I, I, I honestly think that I think I was cut some slack. I think I got what's called an OC's pass, which is you didn't quite make a grade. You were, you were good enough or willing to cut you some slack. Uh, and for someone like me who was just a militant at that point, I mean, I, I, you know, I bought into this cult. <laughs> and so, like, it was, it was very difficult to accept that, I think. I, I you know. I carried that. Um, yeah, I think that 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 was troubling, and um, you know, I think a lot of the people as well held that against me as well. So, so uh, you know, and that's played a part in my life going forward, and that's I think you know to some degree a, a great deal to do with why I am where I am today. Like you, you yeah. don't go through almost two years of a crew company. It's, a, it's supposed to be like 24 years, sorry, 24 weeks of living hell. So they, they take a snotty-nosed civilian kid and they literally break you down and then they rebuild you into something designed to fight and survive on a battlefield. 
not only fight and survive, but to thrive on a battlefield. And you've got to be something different to be able to do that. And the British Army is, has just this an amazing skill doing that to a human being, which mm. is how you know you win wars. Um, so re- recruit company, especially back then, uh, this was back in the 80s. Uh, end of the 80s, 90s, and, and it was absolutely ruthless. And like, you yeah. know, you, they could get away with so much more that they can't get away with now when it comes to recruits. Um, I mean, just getting punched your lights out by the instructors was, was commonplace. So, I mean, you, 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 couldn't, you can't even shout at people today. It's incredible, yeah. the difference. It was rough. And, uh, yeah, you don't go through like two and a half, two years, almost two, almost two years of that without coming out with a couple of scars. <laughs> So I think um, that yeah influenced everything else going forward. Um, yeah, and you know once into the battalion and everything, you know, eventually you know I'd spent altogether almost twelve years in the army. Um, yeah, I, I, I all the way through, I, I, I you know I was fighting against that stigma. I think, I and mean, even if people couldn't yeah, see it, I yeah. certainly felt it, and it was certainly something that I lived. Yeah, I feel like it's. I feel. I definitely feel that. I feel. I feel almost if if you'd passed with flying colours on that fifth attempt, I still feel like there'd be a part of you telling yourself that you weren't good enough. Maybe that's just. Maybe that's just who you are. Maybe even when you finish uh, the Goliath, you're gonna be like, ah, I could have done a bit more. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Am I I accurate Um, there? I don't know. I think I push back on that one. I think if I. I think I would have felt more at ease and at home with the regiment if that had been the case. Yeah. But I never did. Um, yeah. And I think it's largely because of what happened there. Mm. Uh, and, and it's that it's that all about that OC's pass, I think. And I'm pretty sure it was an OC's pass, to be honest. If it had been the other way around, I probably wouldn't have had the issues that I have. Oh, when I say it like that, I mean, when I, the, the issues that I have, it's not like, you know, it's not like I'm having therapy or anything. Like Maybe that. it wouldn't have pushed you to walk around the world as well. It um, might not have happened. It might not have happened. Um, you know, that, I, I, I think that was, I think that had, had a lot to do with it. Well, I know that had a lot to mm. do with that at the time, yes. Yeah, yeah. And you said you don't leave two years in that kind of environment without a lot of scars. I'm assuming there was some physical, but more mental would you say was it is that what you're referring oh, to more yes yes yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's what it's kind brutal. of yeah how long does it take do you still deal with that now and like what what kind of things do you struggle with no i mean i you know i'm i'm older and wiser now and i can look back at that and i can see you know how that that road laid itself out and, and i can see where the issues were but you know i don't i'm 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 not that same guy i i don't still feel like I need to prove myself to the extent like I did. I, I've done a lot now. Yeah. You know, I mean, if, if I, if I died tomorrow, I, 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 I pretty much achieved what I set out. There's no one doubts me that I can get home. You know, I've been on the ground yeah. pushing this thing for 20 odd years and I've got two years to go before I, I cross the finish line. And the only obstacles yeah. in front of me are just geopolitical. And that's it. Yeah. So, I've, I've pretty much achieved my 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 goal already. It's just wrapping it up now. But I was just going to quickly say, yeah, going back to the military, um, I would say, I mean, if somebody had went in there and done it all in 24 weeks and passed uh, with flying colours, bish bash bosh, uh, you know, physical tip top condition, I would say in a way it's arguably more impressive what you did, you know, to stick out that environment for two years when I'm sure most other people, 99% of other people would have quit during that. They would have... They would they would have quit or they would have been kicked out because they they just wouldn't it wouldn't have been working. They'd be like, this is clearly not working. It's been eighteen months. But with you, like you somehow managed to stick it out, and not just yourself. You managed to convince all the people around you that like he is actually worth keeping around, even though he can't seem to pass his physical stuff. Like right. it, that's arguably more impressive than than just somebody that's born into a physically gifted body walks in there yeah. and they're and they're like oh he's a bit of a liability but he's got the physical attributes so he, he just about balances out to let's put him through but you were like yeah you, you didn't have the the natural physicality but everything else had in spades I suppose yes uh, and and I remember getting into into arguments with people and. Um... I, I, I could point to that and I could, you know, I could stand on the parade square and look around me 
and know that there isn't anybody else who's done five who had done five P companies. There was nobody else who spent mm. any longer than me in recruit company, yeah. and, and that took a lot. So there was that, um, and some, and I could throw that around in, in an argument, but um, you know I could wear that like a medal sometimes. But it was a pretty short-lived um, victory. Uh, end of the day, <laughs> it is what it is. Yeah. So when you so you passed that after two years, you got your fifth. You, you passed it on the fifth. And then what happened with your life? So how long were you with the paratroopers? You you travelled the world. I'm pretty sure, right? Not not every country, but you travelled around all sorts yeah. of different environments. Talk to me briefly just about that journey with the paratroopers after you passed through P Company. I mean, uh, life now was great. Um, the only problem was is that we were living in the most peaceful times in the history of humanity. I think back <laughs> in those days, we literally there were no wars to fight. Uh, and that, believe it or not, was was a stress on the regiment. Um, the only altercations we found ourselves in was Northern Ireland. So we were in and out of Northern Ireland quite a bit. In fact, we went back in, the first time was um, 18 nine. I think it was the first time the parachute regiment had returned to Northern Ireland since Bloody Sunday and Warren Point, where things mm. got a little heated between paratroopers and the local population. So they decided to take these rabid dogs out of the police in the community uh, and put us back in the cage, that, that glass case where it says break only in the case of extreme warfare. <laughs> uh, not a little, little sticky note on, they say not policemen. Um, so they got that point. So they took us out and then eventually we three power went back in um, in uh, 89 for a two year tour. And we lost five guys on that tour and a couple of skirmishes, all from my company as it happened, and three of them from my platoon. Um, so, you know, we had a bit of a, a bit of a ding dong for those first two years. And we're in and out of Northern Ireland a couple of times after that. But other than that, there was nothing else going on. And um, towards the end there, when I was leaving, the battalion, um, we were very badly undermanned. We were having a real manning problem. Uh, the, the battalion was almost combat inefficient at the time because everyone was just leaving because they were somewhat disillusioned. They'd, uh, they, you know, they'd been trained. We get we get kept at uh, you know a high level of training and, and just held there uh, for such a long time, which is hard to do when there's nothing going on in the world and we're not being used. And that actually takes a toll. And um, eventually, yeah, a lot of guys were leaving and eventually I left. Probably because of the same thing, you know. There wasn't enough going on to keep me mm. to keep me there. Um, yeah. My mind started wondering and um, I started looking at other ways to challenge myself. Plus the whole thing that I had going on with, um, you know, wanting to prove myself, feeling like I hadn't proved myself, knowing I could do better do more and then eventually all that came to a head when I started looking at maps uh, and started dreaming of doing these these big journeys uh, that were never big enough <laughs> what came first the maps or the horizons uh, the love for which yeah the horizons I had a lot uh, this odd relationship with the horizons I used to get a real kick out of horizons definitely first I mean I can remember that even, even as a kid I do, I do believe where they would be frightening and just exhilarating if you had a good horizon. There was just this fascination with what was over there. And I certainly yeah. remember that coming back at certain times in the, in the regiment. We were deployed. Uh, we did a couple of months, a couple of tours in Kenya and a couple of tours in Norway. And in both those occasions, I remember finding myself in a quiet moment with uh, these incredible vistas on these foreign lands and just, you know, just those horizons were just, incredible just amazing mm. uh, up there in the fjords or up there in the, the highlands during the winter in norway and um, especially on the edge of the rift valley once um in, in africa there but so they yeah. definitely had a i think a reawakening during those years that i traveled with the army and then you know i think the maps that the maps followed after that so at some point once you know i i during this time, I'd, I'd got married. Um, I had a kid. Um, yeah, I was married by the time I was 20. 
Um, we were married for five years. That fell apart. And it was after that relationship fell apart that um, I think I started reassessing life and I think looking for looking for another challenge. And then how did how did you go from, yeah, these kind of, I guess it was converging, like the you needing to prove yourself and feeling like you needed a, a new challenge, plus the maps, plus the horizons. When did they kind of merge and you start to see the bigger picture? You know, it happens over time. And um, I remember the first maps I started looking at, we were, we were actually waiting to jump into Scotland. And the weather was shit, the aircraft couldn't fly, we were grounded, and we were sitting in, in some accommodation somewhere all just waiting for the weather to change so that we could we could go and do this a parachute jump and um mm. i think at that point was the first time i, I had a, a road atlas of the america north america don't know where it came from but um that was the first time i started going through this map drawing lines doing math and thinking oh, how long would it take me to cross you know east to west coast of the united states and that was the first time i think i ever took it started seriously thinking about wow that would be an amazing journey I'd love to be able to do that one day. And then started looking at other routes around the world, but there was nothing long and nothing of a significant time frame or distance that made it worth leaving your career for. Because, um, mm. you know, there was even the Americas, which I thought was really interesting, North South America uh, was like five, six years tops. Uh, just wasn't worth tossing your career away for. So, there was nothing that enticed me over that over that barrier until one day um, I actually got a birthday card from my father. And in the birthday card, he'd written a short note because we, you know, we talked on and off about these silly fantasies. And he'd written in there, he had a conversation with a couple of guys in, in Tutu in the SAS. And they had talked about walking from London to New York over something called the Bering Land Bridge. And the Bering Land Bridge had never played into my plans. Um, you know, I had no idea what that was all about. Uh, and, of course, the, what they're referring to is that very short 57-mile gap between Alaska and Siberia, where those, you know, continents almost touch up there just on the, uh, next to the Arctic Circle. And um, I took a look at that, and then I, I thought, well, if that's theoretically possible... And um, I remember excitedly, because I actually had a wall map above my desk, and I took a, a Sharpie, and I drew a line from the UK all the way out, across Asia, up through Russia, up, right up to, the, to the, the Bering Strait, then over and into the Americas. And I thought, well, why would you stop in New York? You know, I'd already been looking at the Americas, so I just drew that line all the way down to the bottom of South America, and that was it. Once I saw that line, I mean, that's the hairs on the back of your neck standing up and you know, you know, you've got something. And sure enough, I, you know, I looked around and nobody had done anything quite like it. Did some math and now you're looking at, you know, best case scenario was 12 years. Uh, and, you know, it was like somewhere between 36,000 to 30, somewhere between 36, 30,000 miles, depending on those route details. Every time you, it's so long that every time you, you measure the route, you get a different, uh, math. So I just knew I would found what I was looking for at that point. We, we joined yeah. all the continents together. Uh, and then, wow. of course, on closer inspection, there was absolutely no idea what this Bering Land Bridge thing was all about because the, there was no <laughs> Bering Land Bridge. The last Bering Land Bridge was about you know, twelve to 15,000 years ago. Um, <laughs> so that was a, <laughs> a question mark right there. And there was a couple of other obvious um, gaps. One of the first one, well, there was the, the channel tunnel, but that's you know, a political thing. So I don't, yeah. most people aren't, aren't aware, but the channel tunnel has two rail tunnels going north, south, and a maintenance shaft down the center. So there's, there's an option there, right? Um, then there's the Bering Strait, just a huge question mark. No idea what that's going to consist of. However, was it theoretically possible? At the time, I couldn't find any information on anyone who had ever made it. So we were kind of just kind of willing to kick that can down the road. And I do remember the first times I ever looked at the problem, I, I was thinking I was going to have to go north into the North Pole and then back down maybe <laughs> into Siberia. And it just looked horrendous. Um, yeah. But the actual strait itself, there was no, 
there was no indication that he could do it. And I'd found a couple of, um, you know, they were talking about years before the internet. So I was actually down at the Royal Geographic Society in London, looking through some of the old archives there and found a couple of scary stories on people who tried to cross the Bering Straits with dogs and you know, dog teams and things and all failed. Um, so that was looking pretty intimidating. Um, and then there was another gap as well. There was the, the, the Darien Gap, a lesser known challenge, which is the, the border region yeah. between Colombia and Panama. And I was going to ask you about that down. as well. Right. I was definitely going to ask you about that one, yeah. Um, yeah. So there was these, there was these three, three gaps or three linchpins that kind of tied all these continents together. And if we could mm. do that, then, then yeah, we, could, we, we got it. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's just wild. Had you done anything? You hadn't done anything remotely similar before, had you? You hadn't gone and done like uh, no. the length of France or something like that, like uh, just a little warm up. No. So you just, you just had this. No, I mean. It's just huge. Go yeah, on, but it was going through the process, you know, it was, it was doing the math and looking at it and thinking, well, I can do this. You know, I mean, I, I'd spent enough, I was fit enough at the time, right? So, you know, we were doing 50 milers with 40 pounds and a weapon back in the regiment and whatnot. Yeah. So we knew we could do long distance. We knew we could hack it. Um, and, and I think uh, young paratroopers are just, they, 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 you know, the British Army trains you well. You, re you really do believe you're bulletproof. You do believe that you're invincible and you can take on the world, which is a great thing because confidence will take you a long way. And I think that was proved out in, you know, in this case. I wasn't yeah. the fittest guy by any means. In fact, you know, half the reason I was doing this was to prove to the guys, I think in my own mind, that listen, I can, I can do the biggest thing that you couldn't even conceive of doing kind of thing. And it was, it was almost yeah. literally like a, a bad bet in the bar the way this was playing out because it was once I looked at this and started talking about it, the first reaction from, from was just pushback from everybody. It was just the guys just taking the piss. Yeah. Just like, you know, yeah. nah, and not you, you couldn't do this. You're not the guy. Well, Jesus, you know, you don't say that to a young paratrooper, right? You don't tell him he can't do something because guess what? He's going to go and do it. And it was literally almost like a bad bet in the bar. And I remember a couple of shouting matches back and forth where I was like, well, screw you, watch this. And that was it. Now I'm going to go have to go do it, right? <laughs> and that's literally how it kind of came to be. <laughs> uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, so, yeah, once I, once I got into that mode and that was it. Yeah, that was it. Once the guy said, no, shut up, Bushby. Not a chance. Not a chance. That's ridiculous. And I guess there's no one else, you know, took me seriously. When I went out there and started pushing this thing, I think everyone just looked at me and just, oh, it's almost embarrassing, but whatever. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't get any support. And it's funny, before I, before I left the British Army, I actually ended up, uh, one of the last things I ended up getting was an invite to the Queen and Prince Philip's 50th wedding anniversary at Whitehall. Uh, and <laughs> this strange series of events transferred where, where whereby I, I announced my plans to the army so i had decided i'm getting out i'm doing this and i was well into the planning and then i told the army about it and they actually did an article in the in-house magazine for the, the british army at the time can't remember what it's called now but um, they did an article about this paratrooper who was going to go walk around the world and then like days later i got this this gold embraided envelope from 10 downing street and it was um, Prime mm. Minister Tony Blair and First Lady Sherry Blair inviting me to the Prince Philip and Queen's wedding, uh, 50th wedding anniversary. And I no idea what, how this had all come about. But I think what happened was up at the um, you know, divisional headquarters or something, these two things arrived on the desk of the brigadier. And there's this thing about this British paratrooper going to go walk around the world. And then there's this thing from the government saying, look, we need some low-level some um, junior ranked member of the British Army to represent the British Army at this, this function in Whitehall. And he must have gone, uh, yeah, taken care of, there you go, that guy, whatever. <laughs> and I think that's what yeah. I, what, probably how it happened. Like, you got those two things, but yeah, whatever, just do that. So, you know, there was the next thing. I got this envelope, packed my bags, and we were actually in Northern Ireland at the time. And then I found myself in Whitehall sitting at a, a table with all these uh, field marshals and ladies, this, that, the other, and all these TV celebrities, and not having a clue how yeah. we got to that point. But yeah, 
But that, that was funny. It's just this thing just – I hadn't taken you know, two steps, and I was already, you know, getting these invites and things. So that's how it all kind of started. And then shortly after that, I uh, I flew out of Bryce Norton. Yeah. To go to Punta Arenas. Punta Arenas, yeah. Punta Arenas. Southern Chile. Very cool. Yeah. And so you're flying out there, and uh, any regret going through your mind, or just pure excitement at that point? Fear it's pure as well, I suppose. Because you'd spent, I'd spent a bit of anticipation, but I mean, more, more mostly excitement. I, I, you know, I'd spent many years, a couple of years now, trying to get this thing up and running. You know, no one had paid me any attention. Couldn't get anyone interested. Uh, I left home without any kind of sponsor. Um, yeah. I'd been to a trade show, and someone had given me a pair of boots. And someone had given me some footbeds, these orthopedic footbeds, a company called Superfeet. We'll come into the story later as well. But they'd give me these footbeds. And literally, they kind of like give me them so I would go away and leave them alone at the stand in this, um, you know, this one of these um, one of these shows, trade shows. Um, couldn't eat either of them. Had about, you know, $500 in my pocket. I'd blown all my money trying to get this thing up and running. And uh, next thing, uh, you know, one morning I woke up on the side of a road in, in the bottom of South America, faced with this, this, this road that just went on for 36,000 miles, possibly, possibly 12 yeah. years. Yeah. How naive. I, like, I mean, even if it had been 12 years, that must have felt like, uh, you know, like a huge... It's a lifetime. It's a, it's a huge chunk of, yeah, it is. So you're standing there and... You just all every all of your future at that moment is just on that route and on that road and everything. There's no wor- there's no worrying about like oh I've got to do this next year and oh, in six months I've got to go and do this. Just twelve years, you and it's, the road. It's me and a stretch of road. Yeah, and that is it. Yeah, that and it's, been... it's a pretty it's an interesting feeling. Yeah, it's an interesting feeling that first day. And there's a lot of excitement, but there's just that that there's so much unknown. Which I think is what the excitement's all about. I mean, there's, yeah. there's there's adventure, and then there's there's truly adventure, all right? Yeah, there's going for a weekend in the hills, and then there's then there's facing the world. Yeah. And at that point, you know, I was pretty convinced that I wasn't going home. It wasn't going to happen. Um, no matter what the world's about to throw at me, we're going to be hacking this. There's no no plan B. Yeah. Uh, so we, we kind of knew that was going to be the case. And, uh, you know, there was a couple of things. I think uh, looking back through my diaries, there was even an entry that I wrote my first diary entries with, I wrote in a, a cafe in Hull before I left. Um, and I think in there I was um, talking about all the things that I expect. And, and I even mentioned about, you know, how one day I expect I'll probably end up falling in love, and but I'm going to have to walk away from it. I'm going to get burned and I've got to be ready for this. And, I, you know, I could see all of this coming to some degree. Um, yeah. Yeah, wow. That's insane. So how long did it... So from, from where you started, how long was it to the Darien Gap, um, roughly? Like, what kind of distance is that? Two years. Three years. Two years. Two years. Two. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Wow. And it was remarkable because the timings were absolutely spot on to the day. Mm. Yeah, uh, it's funny because we'd split America in two, and the border with Chile, Peru, was year one. And when I set off, it was the first of November when I set off, nineteen ninety eight, and then I hit that you know in November the first, nineteen ninety nine. I hit the last town in Chile on the border, and then the second year was to the the last town in South America, which was Medellin, Colombia, and I arrived on the first of November. Wow. The following year. So we literally hit it bang on, which was amazing considering everything that happened in between. Um, and it is, so we had, the, it, we had the timings down. Yeah. And this is the military timings, isn't it? It's the, to the minute. Um, yeah. <laughs> Medellin, is that where, because you just mentioned you knew you were going to fall in love and have to walk away. Is that, is that where that happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's where it yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I arrived in Medellin. It was amazing because, you know, being the first big, major goal facing that first gap and a tricky one, the Darien gap, which is pretty scary. And Colombia was pretty scary at the time. At the time, Colombia was like kidnapped central of the world. It was in a, a virtual civil war. It was just a nasty place. Mm. And I remember all, we were all pretty concerned. Um, 
my father sent me a professional will form to sign before I crossed the border. Yeah. And I sent back pieces of equipment now because we expected to get at least robbed once or twice. <laughs> I mean, we're in the Daring Gap or in Colombia? Oh, in Colombia before yeah. we even get to the Darien. So the Darien Gap is after Colombia, yeah, going into Panama. Is that right? It's I think, as you're leaving Colombia, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But we got okay. we got to get through Colombia, and I remember that being been quite a challenge because there were just so many horror stories. Yeah. Uh, and literally, you know, they're, they're fighting along that along those roads. So for wow. this blonde, blue-eyed gringo to just waltz down the road like nothing happened, I wasn't going to end well. <laughs> 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 um, but it was remarkable how much we got away with, and um, you know, a couple of scary, couple of scary incidents. I mean, I'd, I'd only been in one or two days, maybe on my second day, I think, where I, because at night I tend to try and hide away. Um, I sleep better if no one knows where I am, for all these reasons. Yeah, <laughs> and I and I, I tried to get up onto some dead ground on a hill, and I'd slip back down. Just at the point that these people passed me on a, on a, a motorbike and they were kind of looking at me all wide-eyed. Um, and eventually I got back up and I put up my tent and then not long after, a, you know, a torch light hit the outside of the tent and I thought, oh, shit, oh. Someone, someone, you know, a farmer's found me or something. And anyway, I stuck my head out and, and was greeted with two people in ski masks with M16s. And that torchlight just hit me in the face, and then they just started screaming, "Get out!" And I'm like, "Oh, here we go." Oh, shit. You know, I thought, I thought that's it. You know, I'm, I don't. I think it was the at the time I thought it was a group called the ELN, which was prevalent in the south of Colombia, and they almost exclusively make their living from kidnapping people, especially stupid Westerners mm. walking down the road in this war zone. So it was all this yelling, and I, I'm I'm out in front of my tent with my hands on my head and everything. And, there was, there was 10 of them. One of them was a woman and, one, and the other one's a guy. And they, they come around with the guns and they're just really focused on who was in that tent with me. And once they figure out I'm alone and then I hand over my passport and then it was just police and army just came out from everywhere. No way. And what, what had happened is I'd put my, I'd tented um, about a kilometer or two from an airfield, um, obviously, which is a sensitive location. And those people on the, the motorbike and they'd see me trying to climb that, that hill up during the night. And obviously reported me. And they'd, all, they'd crashed out the defenses of this airfield looking for the guerrillas, expecting a fight. Yeah. And found me. <laughs> and um, once they figured out who I was, all, everyone just kind of closed in and they're all taking out flasks and smacking alcohol and just turning into a real ging gang googly because everyone <laughs> could tell that they were relieved. There's going to be no uh, blood and bullets that night. Yeah, uh, but that was like day two or something in Colombia. That's insane. Yeah. I bet I bet their relief was nothing compared to yours. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I point. think everyone was quite happy at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. And you know, and but and and the, and going through Colombia, it was amazing because I, I I literally went through Colombia like smoke drifting across the battlefield and interacted with nothing. Wow. Um, and there was stuff going on in front of me and a day behind me because you know I'd stay with soldiers when I could. And you'd find them along the side of the road. Um, and then the next day, I heard that uh, groups of guys that I'd stayed with had gotten a firefight and one of them had been killed. Mm. And then I'd find, you know, long queues of trucks along the side of the road and then eventually pass where the guerrillas had had a checkpoint and they just burned and looted a whole, you know, row of trucks and stuff. Um, and, but I just seemed to, to slip on through mm. all the way up into Medellin. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's insane. That's uh, that's, was that the only time you got woken up with a gun in your face, or did it happen again? Oh no, uh, there's been a few cases I've been looking at gun rather than the gun. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, and then we made a gym, which was the last last town in South America, and a big deal because we faced the Darien Gap, which was going to be no no easy task. Yeah. Um, at the time, a very complex environment. I didn't know much about it until yesterday, to be honest. So it's like a, it's right. like a, it's a, a no big, it's a big area, isn't it? Where it's just between the two countries, and it's like rivers, mountains, dense, heavy jungle, gangs, you know, and, and people die there in all sorts of ways, right? Am I giving that a fair, oh, yeah. sa- fair summary? Yeah, you, you briefly touched on on the tip of that iceberg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you want to say anything else about it? Because I'm sure lots of people listening, watching, oh, don't yeah. really I know mean, much about it. 
Right, the Darien Gap. So it's the border between Colombia and Panama. And there's, uh, you, could, you could drive from Prudhoe Bay, the top of Alaska, all the way down to Punta Arenas in Chile, except for this gap. Right, that's why they call it Darien Gap, and it's called, the name Darien comes from the fact that this is it consists of two pristine pieces of jungle, uh, Los Quitos Park on the um, Colombian side and the Darien Park on the uh, Panamanian side. That's where it gets its name, the Darien Gap, and um, it's just this like a two hundred mile swath of pristine jungle, which is and it's just you know heavily rivered, waterlogged no tracks, and it's what you call secondary jungle. Primary jungle is what you, ex- is sometimes what you, people think of when they think of jungle. It's like the Amazon, where you have these great big high tree canopies, mm. and they stop a lot of light getting to the forest floor. And generally speaking, there's not a lot of undergrowth. You can move a lot easier in a primary jungle. Secondary jungle is just like a pile of fucking rose bushes. I mean, like trying to punch through that shit is just absolutely monstrous. Um, it's some real bad bush. It's just thick, dense undergrowth. Um, and it's, yeah, it's brutal. And just a lot of, you know, even getting into the Darien Gap was the first main problem. And we're just talking about terrain right now. We're not talking about the geopolitical situation laid across the top of that. So this is just the terrain was, was quite intense. Um, so even getting into that jungle was, was a ch- real, real challenge. People get in there normally by using boats, which is what I couldn't do because I can't use any form of transport. Mm. Um, so I had to get in on foot and throw it on foot. And then, of course, on top of that, you have this, um, it's basically a war zone. So you've got the front line of fighting between the FARC guerrillas, which are these, you know, the premier um, revolutionary armed forces of Colombia, which is basically the hangover from the Cuban Revolution who have been fighting the Colombian government for something like, you know, 60 years or something. Mm. And they were fighting the Colombian government on 60 fronts all the way around the country. Um, and, you know, it was, it was, these were difficult days. Um, the army was, the Colombian government was under a lot of pressure. And um, so you had this, this front line that I had to get through fighting. The, the, the jungle itself was held by the guerrillas. And then you've got these another um, group of right-wing paramilitaries who are fighting the communist left-wing guerrillas um, and fighting the army apparently as well, although that wasn't the case in reality. Um, so you have quite an incredible mix, and it's just lawless. So uh, and, and there's the cartels. So you're looking at you know the home of the, co- the cocaine cartels. Uh, of Colombia, and this was the this is really where it's all happening, right? I mean, Medellin was literally built built by Pueblo Escobar, mm. um, and there all the cocaine plantations and those factories and plants, processing plants are in that jungle, and they're basically protected by FARC, who have been paid a handsome sum to do that. Um, it's just a, and, and you know, because of all of this, you've got you know they've got the DEA in there and CIA, and you've got. We even got the IRA in there teaching the left-wing guerrillas how to make bombs and IEDs. So you, you've also got elements of MI6 in there and whatnot. So you've got yeah. like this, this mixed bag of insurgency, counterinsurgency, counter-narcotics, all this drug flowing, going north, the guns and money coming back in. It's just an absolute nightmare. So no one trusts anybody. And if you don't, you know, if you're not from that part of the world, some you're going to get spotted pretty quick. And um, just full of horror stories, just full of death, mm. you know, and a lot of tales of gringos. Even even a Russian cyclist who cycled on the road to the Darien Gap was stopped by the left-wing communist guerrillas and was just shot in the head um, uh, on the spot, you know, and you just don't know how it's going to go. There's, yeah. There are stories where these guys will stop tourists on buses and there'll be Americans on that bus and they'll take all the passports off of them give them the passports back and send them on their way, not say anything. You just don't know how it's going to go. And I think six months before I, I arrived in Medellin, two British botanists had gone into the Darien Gap looking for rare orchids and had vanished or presumed dead. Mm. Uh, no one had heard from them again. Um, so that was, that was the most relevant case. Um, but right before I was due to leave Medellin, because I'd spent a couple of months there planning this, and where I met Catalina, 
and they had developed this relationship. But just before I was about to leave there, these two botanists actually stumbled out of the jungle. And they, they had been held by Fark. And then Fark had just decided to kind of let them go around Christmas. Mm. And, um, and it's kind of funny because they, they kind of let them go. And then these two guys ran off into the jungle, realized not a cat in hell's chance were they getting out of that jungle. So I had to go back to their captives and ask nicely for a map. Which I thought was pretty cute. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think they actually wrote a book about it, I think, as well. I can't remember their names. But, um, oh, wow. but that was just a, you know, it, it's just a crazy place. And even after I got through there, there was a young, I was reading about a young um, Scandinavian, might have been a Dutch kid, um, university student, I think, went into the Darien Gap. Uh, they caught him and beat him up, put him up against the tree and shot him. Um, and that was in the same the same region that I was in, near Rio Susio. Um, so it's it's a it's a serious place, and if you don't take it seriously, you're going to get mm. killed. Um, so we we had you know a pretty hardcore plan, and and being me and my father, ex paratrooper and ex special forces, of course this was this is our ele- we're in our element at this point because this was an escape and evasion exercise. Um, so we got to put our skills to use, and and kind of mm. sneak through the Darien Gap best we could. Avoiding people. I mean, but uh, you know, the first stage, I had to kind of do my best to almost disguise myself as a as a vagrant to kind of play down the fact that I was actually worth kidnapping. So I mm. kind of disguised myself as a hobo. Um, I don't know how good that had worked, but um, again, everybody that was that saw me on the road, I was I was intercepted a couple of times, but it was mostly by the right wing. Um, the right wing paramilitaries. I didn't have a problem with gringos. Um, so I got lucky that way. I uh, had to go cross country around a couple of places along this road that was held by the guerrillas. And the road itself was, was would get captured by FARC. And, and then there'll be these huge fights and then the army would take it back. And then FARC would retake these towns along the road. And it was just back and forth. So you're pretty much now in a, in a, uh, in a war zone at that point with some incredible stories. Um, talking to the locals, yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. So a very, very troubled part of the world. Uh, I think at the time, the British media were calling it one of the darkest places on the planet because of its, its, its you know, track record of deaths. Yeah. Um, and just lawlessness. From the research I did, it did. That's the kind of things I saw as well. That like the the, the most dangerous place on the planet. One of the you know just the most terrifying places and all this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It seems just crazy. Like, were you were you scared going through there? Were you scared coming up to it? Uh, yeah, there, there's a certain amount of apprehension. Um, you know, I was fairly confident I could do it. I would look at the situation. I'd interviewed. A, a whole bunch of people, anyone who worked, the uh, journalists, police, army, been to the headquarters. I kind of got privy to a lot of information. I kind of knew what, what, what was going on in the Darien Gap. And um, I was fairly confident I could do it. But there were a couple of really close misses, a couple of close passes with the, uh, with the fart gorillas right out. Mm. And one of the most sensitive parts was I had to get from one town, one village, down this dirt track, and it was the only track I could get through these, like ever, basically like the Everglades of of, um, of Florida kind of scenario. Get through this jungle to this other town that was con- that was held by the army and the right wing paramilitaries, but was under siege, and and FARC had that track, and uh, so basically I was being briefed by the the right wing paramilitaries because I. When I got into this village, I had to go see this right this paramilitary commander to get permission from him to be there and to go from beyond that point. And um, and they were pretty blunt. They were like, "Listen, Gringo, nobody goes down the track. Fark has the track. Um, if Fark catch you on the track, they won't shoot you because the sound of a gun will give away their position. They'll put you under the knife, Gringo. Mm. You know, and they're looking you in the eyes and they're like." Yeah. So there's this pretty in, you know, intense day that I had before I did this track where I think, you know, everything I'd kind of been working up to up to this point, I kind of knew that one day we would face that track. 
Uh, one day this track was coming in whatever form, um, but that was definitely the, some serious pucker factor there where, you know, everyone's like, dude, don't go down the track <laughs> into this jungle. And yeah. I remember, you know, I'm like, no, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to do it. So, you know, you got on with it. And I remember trying to leave that village and walking out past all these Colombian soldiers in these fighting trenches. They're actually dug in, you know, with weapons pointing down range. And they were kind of looking, looking at me, walking past them out into this jungle. And they were just like, whoa, whoa, you know, no, no, it's stupid, no. <laughs> so the army took me off to one side and they kept me there overnight. And uh, the commander on the ground there actually made me, once he'd got permission, they said they couldn't stop me from going down the track, but they, they made me sign paperwork. We had a one-on-one -on -one interview with a dictaphone mm. and he would, you know, explain everything and say, do you understand what I'm telling you? I had to say yes it's my decision. I understand. And then they let me go. And then they sent a radio message to the guys uh, in the siege in this village called Rio Sucio. And they said, look, crazy gringo coming if he makes it. And then away I went. And that, that was, that was pretty tough. That was, yeah. Cause there was, it was a 60, col it was a 60, yeah, 60 kilometer journey, I think. So 30. So I literally slept halfway down that track that night and right off in that off off that track now, at this time you know we're playing sensible game there's no light we're not making any noise so eating cold food you don't cook you don't use any light source whatsoever and i'm off the track pretty much camouflaged in the jungle and sure enough there was a that night that evening just just before last light well actually just right before light disappeared so it's kind of like a um just got that kind of blue dark blue sky and i could just see through the um, the foliage to a part of the sky where, that what was silhouetted and this patrol passed me by and there was a twenty man patrol passed me by ten feet from the track that night and it was the only people that apparently go down there was Fark mm. and um, you could hear the, you could hear the guns you could hear the metal you know it's a distinct yeah. sound and the scariest thing about that was the next day I had to go back on I had to get on that track and go in the same direction. That, they, that that patrol had gone. And the way it normally works in the jungle on these tracks, it's all about ambushes. So you're pretty much convinced there's an ambush about a K down the road, and I'm going to walk into that. And I remember just absolutely shitting it that day. And I remember one of the, the, the funniest things was the birds. The birds would start squawking. And normally you don't pay any attention when the birds squealing, squawking these alarm calls. And when they started, oh, my God, it was deafening. And I just remember it driving me nuts. Because it was just so obvious there was someone out there on the track with all these birds screaming at you. Mm. Uh, yeah, that was oh, pretty man. hairy. Yeah, I, I guess I bet that messed with your mind as well. I can't even imagine the thoughts and like things racing through uh, your mind yeah. as you're walking down. That's wild. It's yeah. So there was the jungle. There was pretty intense, and yeah, I got to Rio Sucio. I hung out with the troops there for a while, and um, and then eventually I. I from that point on, it was a river journey, so I had to I had to camouflage myself as floating debris, and I had this like combat vest that we turned into a life vest with these plastic bottles, and uh, my backpack was filled with plastic bottles, so it floated. And then we just covered everything with foliage, and then I'd, I'd just drift for like mm. four days down this river. Mm. Um, and in the jungle, there's a lot of a lot of stuff floating in the rivers, little mangroves and stuff. So you could just blend in with it. And then everyone, because in, in the jungles, the rivers are the highways and they're used by everybody, you know, friend and foe alike. And if you get caught in the river, you, you, you're screwed. There's no escape. You can't run for it. You're stuck. So it was, you know, that was um, another interesting part of the trip. It was just spending time in this river and meeting all the crocodiles. And I got, I got caught twice. Um, I think the first time, and it's quite it's a huge river. The River Otrato at parts is a kilometer wide. It's a massive wow. river in parts. Um, mm. So sometimes you can be way out in the middle of nowhere. And I remember once we were floating down the river, and I had these two Coke bottles, like two liter Coke bottles, stuck down the front of this vest. And um, one of them came loose, and like, poof, you know, pops out and lands just out of reach, throwing off all my buoyancy and loosens everything so this bottle so i'm in the water trying to keep all this together kind of like and we're kind of rotating while i'm in the water 
Mm. And then eventually I get this bottle back and get myself sorted out. But way up on, on, on the back there, there was a, a village, a hut, a straw hut village. And um, after all the commotion, I kind of sat and I watched and I could see all these kids running along the bank. And then they, they got to the, the village and then everyone started manning the canoes. And then sure enough, all these canoes started coming out. I was like, ah, shit. You kind of, you know, you're not going anywhere at that point. And I didn't know who they were. And as they were approaching, I see them get the boat hooks out and stuff. And there's actually nothing you can do at this point. But it turned into a real funny situation because obviously they were just, these locals were just concerned. They'd seen someone in the river and they came out and they were all just trying to pull me out of the water. And then I'm fighting with them like, no, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just leave me alone. I'm happy here. Just, you know, and there's just this real weird, tense standoff. <laughs> and this confusion where these guys are looking at one of them, looking at me, what? Like, I just found this white guy just drifting down this river in this jungle. And he's like, no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Cheerio. I'm fine. Thanks. Just leave me be. And he can see. And as I, as I float away, they're all just standing in the canoes looking at one of them and looking at me. And going, yeah, what the hell is that all about? And away I went on my merry way, very slowly down this river. So that was kind of amusing. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's hilarious. <laughs> how long was yeah. it? How long did it take to get through the whole Darien Gap? Well, I mean, from Medellin, Colombia, to when I could sit down and say it was done in the British Embassy in Panama was two months. Two months. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And it, it was quite a long time in that jungle, and that jungle is just absolutely horrific. It really is gruesome. Mm. And I, when I started, by the time I got there, I was, I was sick as a pig, and I had really bad diarrhea and. Didn't have enough food to make it. Rations were nowhere near enough to give me enough energy. And, you know, we, uh, once I'd got out of the river, eventually into the, the highlands and headed for the border, uh, it was just absolutely ferocious. Because I would, you know, bushwhacking um, just till dawn, you'd probably get like two or three kilometers if you were lucky. Yeah. Wow. It, just, it was just such a bad terrain. It just sounds. It just but, sounds like insane, incredible, and insane. Um, did you see? Did you see many or any? I'm guessing you saw some dead bodies, like corpses. No. No, no really. Nothing. Okay, because I'd read no, when I was looking no. into it, I read that like people were just dying everywhere and and basically being left. Well, now, um, I mean, since then, since then, it's turned it's turned into a major. If you go to the north of um, the Darien. There's the narrowest gap, the narrowest point. Um, I went straight through the middle. If you go up north, it's where all the, the human trafficking is going. Yeah. These are the human trafficking routes. Mm. So there's just streams of people getting taken through mm. there these days. And yeah, they're dying and being raped and being shot and whatever. And yeah. Apparently up there, you'll find you'll probably find bodies floating down rivers and all kinds of stuff. But where I was at the time, there was no sign of humanity at all. In fact, it's one of the only places in the world I've been. Where there was absolutely no sign of humanity, mm. no, you know, no fag but no coat pole ring, in, anywhere in that jungle along those rivers. You just there's no sign of humanity, and mostly because the gorillas had pushed out the indigenous indigenous population, and what tracks used to be there were all over, you know, grown grown over. So and plus I was also having to you know, avoid using the tracks because that's how you're going to get yourself caught. So we were pretty much straight down the middle. Um, following a compass heading holy crap that was just monstrous wow um real ordeal but just an amazing place yeah like a pristine jungle is is a pretty amazing place there's very it's a unique place it's, you don't find places like it um, yeah it's it's absolutely fantastic place to to a great experience um i i just wish i hadn't been quite so highly strung as i was at the time because at the time, it was all about surviving and avoiding people. Um, always, it's all about the gorilla threat. Yeah. Yeah. And always kind of looking behind your shoulder and thinking, what's, yeah. what's coming around the corner? Yeah. I mean, all but the way through, even once you get into Panama, and then eventually you kind of start relaxing a bit. And then eventually, of course, I run into the Panamanian police and I have a real tense standoff and I'm at gunpoint. And I have no idea who it is at the time. I just walked into them and I'm thinking of them clear. And then I literally come across a guy uh, with an AK-47 in a green uniform, and that to me is fuck. And I just couldn't believe it. And we're at gunpoint, and he's screaming at me, and I'm screaming at him. And then, you know, it turns out that eventually it was, I realized it was the um, Panamanian police. Because mm. they don't have an army as such. They, you know, after the Americans 
got rid of the, the Panamanian army after the invasion. So they they have a police force that stands in on the army and they're fighting the Colombian guerrillas as well because the Colombians are on the Panamanian side raiding towns and villages for food and medicine and whatnot. So they're, they're dealing with it. But Oh, my goodness. And then 18 days in jail in Panama. Oh, really? On the Panamanian side. Yeah, what was that like? What was jail in Panama like, 18 days in jail? Well, that was a bit of route, an ordeal as well because I'd, I'd got to this, the first main village a Latino village in, um, in called uh, Boca de Cooper in, in the Darien Gap uh, and run into these soldiers. I ended up at gunpoint. All this commotion. When everyone calmed down and they realized that, you know, I'm a Brit, um, big surprise to them because the border's closed. No one's allowed to cross it because of the war and everything. But then they, they because they, they want to know who I am, what's going on. I'm in a green uniform with a combat vest, um, you know, so they, they, it's funny because they said, oh, we've got a place for you to stay. You'll be safe here. It's fine. I'm like, oh, guys, that's fantastic. Thanks very much. So they put me inside and they put me in this room and they close the door and lock it. And <laughs> it's a jail, basically. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, what gives? And they're like, well, there's a few issues. And they're like, you know, we don't know who you are. We don't know where you've come from. It's a war zone. We're going to have to kind of dig into this a little bit, maybe. And I'm like, oh, here we go. So yeah. we end up in this whole thing where I can't, I can't talk, call, call anybody or anything, but I'm held in this, this jail. And the guys were great. They were good to me. They would take me out and feed me. And, but they had to, they'd been told to keep me. And then eventually they'd send a helicopter to come and pick me up to take me into, and I was like, you know, arguing with them. But eventually a helicopter came, grabbed me. The helicopter sprung a fuel leak. So I had to land in um, Yavitsa, another small town. The first town where there's um, a, a dirt road to get out. So this is the first where the road ends mm. on the um, Panamanian side. The helicopter had to land there. And then I found myself at a police station being mixed with some Colombians who had been picked up trying to get through the Darien Gap. So the Panamanians have got this whole operation because there's all kinds of undocumented you know immigrants trying to get north to the promised land through the Darien Gap and they kind of scoop them up every now and then so I found myself just being thrown into this group and you know they've taken everything off of me they've taken my bootlaces out and next thing I know I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a column of convicts being escorted out of a, build, a police station onto a truck the helicopter now wasn't working transported to the HQ where they wanted to take me a regional HQ eventually and um, then, then we were just put in rooms and interrogated, and they'd just bring you in, question you, want to know why I was, where I was going and why, why I was traveling with the Colombians. I'm not traveling with the Colombians. <laughs> you put me in with the Colombians. But they couldn't quite get over this thing where I'm with the Colombians, and I'm like, guys, you put me in a truck with the Colombians and not with the Colombians. <laughs> so there was a lot of that. And then they put me in this, this cell, um, just a small cramped cell with a hole in the floor to shit in and a piece of cardboard to sleep on. And there was me, a couple of peruanos, you know, one or two other individuals from South America. And I was in there for a, a week or something. And then eventually they transported me from there to uh, a large prison for um, low-level criminals, mm. just uh, sex offenders and thieves and stuff like that. The murderers, they all go to, um, to Panama City. But it was a hell of an experience getting put into this compound. There's just hundreds of these criminals. You know, this, it's rough. And I'm the only white guy within maybe 700 miles of that place at that time. Yeah. And so getting tossed into that cell, that, this yard with these people was amazing. But they'd all heard about me because there'd been this commotion, I guess. Because during this time, the, 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 the head of the intelligence services for Panama had been really interested in me and had taken me out of the cell and had, uh, had been asking me questions and things about what I'd seen. And he, he knows my background was military and he knows I had a GPS. So he started asking me questions. And when I realized the kinds of questions he was asking, I was like, okay, look, just get me a map, get me a red pen, a blue pen, and a black pen, and just let me have at it. And I just like populated this map with all this information on where the Colombian army was, the size of the unit, the name of the unit, yeah. turnaround times, 
and I could comment on their discipline. I could comment on their defenses. I could comment on their radios and weapons because to me it was all interesting. And throughout this entire process, I'd been exposed to all this stuff. Like the Colombian soldiers, the, the officers would sit down with me with one of their maps. And I would look at, you know, we'd be comparing maps and things. But I don't think that they thought that this long-haired, skinny, hippie kid knew what was written on the map. But my last job in the army was the intelligence cell for the battalion. Maps is what it was all, what it was all about. <laughs> and their maps were all mapped up in NATO symbols. So I could just take a look at their map and come up with a wealth of information, which I just, you know, I was getting it from all over the place. So I could put all this down for the Panamanians and say, there you go. That's what it looks like. And they yeah. were just ecstatic. They were just absolutely <laughs> over the moon. Because I just don't know how much information they get. But, and I, you know, I'd seen, I'd, you know, I'd seen where the, the right-wing paramilitaries had radio bases and seen how they operate. I'd met them a number of times and, so I, I gave them a whole bunch, and um, so they were really, really happy. And so I made a, a good friend out of this intelligence officer who, who eventually had me taken out of this big jail. And they, once he saw me in there, he made them take me out, and he, they made them put me in the police. They kept me in the police canteen for the last, like, week or so while I was in there. Mm. Um, and it was basically until they could clear things up. They were happy as to who I was. The British embassy knew I was coming. We just couldn't communicate with the British embassy. And it was during some holiday festive season as well. So there was always delays and it took a long time. You're out in the jungle. Everything takes a long time. Yeah. So eventually, eventually they just let me go. And, and then I had to make my way back into the jungle. So I had to go all the way back into the jungle, get to Bucky the Cooper, get the, the captain, down, the, 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 the army captain in charge to sign paperwork to say that I'd come back to where I'd stopped. So, you know, I couldn't use that helicopter. Wow, Turn man. around and come back out of the jungle um, before I could get on my merry way again. So, and then eventually, two weeks later or something, I think it took me to get to, to the embassy in uh, Panama City. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. That's amazing. Um I guess we're going to have to skip a few countries and stuff coming up because I, I, I'm conscious of the time and things like that. And I, there's a, obviously How a couple of things. I mean, we're all right for now, but I feel like we're going to touch on the next topic for a, a little while, the next place, destination, oh, yeah. um, the next the next gap. Uh, but yeah, if there's any like huge things that you really want to talk about in between there and the Bering Straits, the land bridge, um, by all means, like dive in. I know there's probably loads and at the same time. There's like, loads, but I mean, uh, yeah, it's... It's nothing, you know, to that degree. Once you leave Panama, um, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You just, day in, day out, <laughs> 30K days. Things were getting better at that point, I think. Uh, South America had been tough because we'd, we we'd run out of money yeah. for a big chunk of South America, living off the land and stealing food from farms and eating trash. And, you know, there were a couple of low points, shall we say. Um, things were tough still in South Central America, uh, but we were getting a bit of money from home because my my mother, who worked in a uh, basically a chocolate factory, was was going around getting handouts. You know, people throwing in pennies, mm. but it was enough to keep me going and keep me fed to nice. a degree. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty good. That kept me going. Things were a little easier. Central America, and then eventually, of course, the next big one was stepping into North America, which was pretty big. Um, leaving Latin America behind after so many years. Yeah, uh, that was that was a big day and a big what huge year change. Did you, huge what change. year did you cross over into North America? Or what? No, I'm not asking It'd what day. Towards, like what, what year? Right, what month? Yeah, kind of it thing? was it was the end. It would have been the end of 2001, 2002, I think. Okay, so like two, maybe, three years. Yeah, it's maybe 2000. It's probably towards the end of 2001. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd crossed, you know, we'd crossed the Darien Gap in the beginning of 2001. And we were leaving, I think, Central Central America by the end of 2001. Yeah. Yeah, oh. that was a shock to the system, stepping into North America. Yeah. So there was just all of a sudden everything's way more developed and all that kind of thing. There's rules. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been, I'd, been, I'd been living literally um, in such a lax lifestyle in, in Latin America. You can get away with just about anything, right? So as soon as you walk into America... I was running into the police constantly. Yeah. And this was um, post 9-11. So 9-11 mm. you know, was not long ago at that point. And um, 
So, yeah, the police were just all over me. Uh, every time I sat down, especially in the city, the police would get called. They would turn up at night and move me on in my tent. Um, things like you can't fill up your, you can't fill up a gas bottle with gasoline at the gas station. What's that all about? Yeah. Uh, just little <laughs> things were just so annoying. <laughs> and everywhere I went, the police. I mean, I remember once trying to go and use the internet at the library, and I think it was Phoenix, Arizona, and being turned away by the police who wouldn't let me near the building. And they literally, they, their hands on their holsters, screaming at me to turn around and go away because I was I had this this box with me on wheels, right? And it looked like freaking, you know, um, some kind of um, um, terrorist at that point with a long clothing <laughs> and looked a right mess and just looked very shady. So they wouldn't even let me near the buildings. They would yeah. just yell at me to go away, turn around and go away. <sighs> Uh, I couldn't get anyway. Oh, that was so annoying. But um, yeah, North America was a bit of a surprise. But again, North America, you know, I had a good time. I met a lot of people. Everyone looked after me. And then the, the next big thing was heat. I walked into Arizona, Nevada at midsummer, and it was just absolutely horrific. Yeah. I was like, I remember it hit like 51 degrees Celsius at one point. Nice. And there was, there was nosebleeds and collapsing. Mm. And there was attempts to sleep, a walk during the day, sleep during the a walk at night, sleep during the day. Couldn't do that because you can't sleep in that heat. No, it was getting, I became delirious, hallucinating. Couldn't get sleep at all um, until I eventually found a rhythm where I could um, walk early hours, hide during the day, walk again in the evening, get some the dark hours to a bit of sleep, and get up early. Um, and it was, we had this routine going where we could do that at night. But oh my god! Yeah. I mean, literally, you know, I went into I went into Vegas. Then outside of Vegas, there is literally the land is called the Valley of Fire around Lake Mead, uh, and it was just absolutely brutal. And then up into Montana, uh, up through Utah and Montana, and then crossed into Alberta, Canada, then up the Alaskan Highway. Right up, all the way up to the end of the road, um, Fairbanks, Alaska. Which obviously then everything changed again. Um, and we'd said on the paperwork, we'd said six years for the Americas. And I arrived uh, in, in Fairbanks on the sixth year. Hmm. Um, but then we faced crossing Alaska. I arrived in May. We'd looked at it, decided I couldn't do it during the summer months because basically the tundra is kind of waterlogged during the summer months. So we spent a long summer waiting for the winter. Then when winter came in, the rivers set. And then as is commonplace up there, you travel using the, the rivers, frozen rivers. Um, and then it took me, I think that first winter, I set off too early. I set off in December, um, which is a no-go really for that part of the world. Soft, deep snow, mm. absolutely horrific. Got an absolute ass whooping. Took four months to get to the coast. Just absolutely brutal. And their temperatures, I think the lowest was, again, the lowest was, um, without a wind chill factor, was minus 51. So from 51 degrees Celsius down to minus 51 yeah. Celsius. Um, that was That's the coldest it got on that trip. Um, and then I met up with this guy called Dimitri Kiefer, yeah. who was an adventure racer on the trail. And he had heard about me wanting to cross the Bering Strait. So he volunteered to join me on the Bering Strait. He wanted in on that. He was like, oh, what? He wanted in on Somebody's that. crossing the Bering Strait? <laughs> right. He said, that sounds so crazy. I want to do it. He had no idea what the Bering Strait was about. <laughs> so it was kind of funny. Um, so we just, so he decided to join me. So I had to, I got to the, the coast and then I had to leave because my visa ran out. Uh, and then we start this really long process where we can only move during the winter. So then I had to wait the year. Uh, to go back the next winter, pick it up, um, up along the coast with, uh, I joined Dimitri, so me and Dimitri going up the coast. Again, a couple of near-death experiences on that trip. There's a couple of hard lessons learned. Mm. Um, Dimitri got frostbite at one point. And there was just one, one story in particular I should mention, but we were basically now traveling along the coastline of Nome, Alaska. And at one point, we... A storm system started moving in and we had minus 40 degrees weather 
with this strong wind front. And we worked out with the wind chill factor, it got down to minus 98 degrees Celsius, which is insane. This was, this was painful. This is where you can't yeah. stop moving. And you can feel, you know, everything has to be covered. Everything. Yeah. You can't expose anything. And you can literally feel, you know, the liquids in your joints start to freeze if you stand still long enough. And I remember Dimitri at one point took his glove off for like a second to do something and got that glove back in, but lost a tip of three fingers in, 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 within those moments that he had his glove off. And literally, they died with frostbite. So, I mean, it was pretty horrific. But I remember at one point when the winds were really bad, we decided to hunker down because we're using the coastline. It was the best, best, like there's this gap between this piles of sea ice and the actual deep snow along the coast. is like a thin strip where it's the easiest to travel. So we were using that. And then at one point, the weather got so bad that we hunkered down on a peninsula, so behind the cliff. So we pushed our tent up against that cliff and then hunkered down for like 36 hours. And literally the tent would like push down on top of us. Mm. And then we just got enough sleeping bags, hunkered down and just rode that storm out. And then, you know, after a good, a good while, we decided, look, we've got to get out and get moving. We haven't got the food to sit around. So we, we got up, we started getting motivated. And I remember I got out of the tent first and I'm taking a look around and like the world had just gone. The world had changed. And I'm, I'm like, I don't, I don't get this. And well, from the distance, I can see these peaks of mountains sticking up above these clouds. And I'm like, no, oh, this is making sense. And I got my GPS out and the GPS put me about 30 miles out to sea. Um, so literally the storm had come and just took all the ice along the coast and just tossed us out. We had no idea, so yeah. we're we're on our way to Japan at this point, <laughs> and I and I was just like, Dimitri, get out of here, you got to see this. I remember we, we both of us were just kind of laughing at this point. Once it kind of, and then it started to sink in, and like you know, we had to go on our way, God knows where. So we were like, shit. So we you know we packed, we started moving, but immediately we were just there was nothing, it was just water and slush, and we were like, oh, we're fucked, we're done. Yeah. So we ended up making that dreaded phone call on the sat phone. And um, sure enough, we, we called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard like, oh, you're kidding us. It's like Super Bowl Sunday. Everyone's <laughs> drinking. We've got no pilots. What do you mean you got no pilots? It's the living Coast Guard, for Christ's sake. So they had to hire some civilian in the chopper to come out and pick us up. And he, he, he took us back to the peninsula, dropped me off, and took Dimitri to Nome to get his fingers looked at. And then I pushed on just horrific uh, couple of incidents. Um, and then eventually, because of these storms and things, then eventually Dimitri joined me in another village. And to cut a story story, we, we made it to, to know to Wales, right on the very tip of uh, the end of the Americas. Mm. And so that was in 2007. Wow. No, 2006, sorry, 2006, because now we were looking at the Bering Strait. Yeah. And then me and Dimitri, this was early winter, I think it was, Oh, it must have been late end winter. It was the later end of winter. And then we took so a little bit of time out in Fairbanks. We backtracked to Fairbanks and, and did a lot of training and planning in the rivers there for the Bering Strait. Invented all kinds of equipment and got all these expensive suits and night vision goggles. We had guns, all the radios and everything that we needed, all the equipment that we needed, and then just went for it on the Bering Strait come that spring. So March was the best time to attempt that that. Um, what was destined to be a failed attempt. At this point, now, at this point, um, I'd learned on the journey north that uh, two Russians had made it across the Bering Strait. And I think it was some point in 98. So it would have been, I think it was just before I left to start the journey, these two Russians, father and son team, had made it across the Bering Strait on their fourth attempt. Mm. Um, there are some caveats there. There are some questions, but apparently, yeah, um, apparently they made it. Um, as to where they were picked up by the Coast Guard was in question. But um, so, essentially, they were the first to make it across the Bering Strait, which mm. was fantastic news once I'd learned about it because it meant it was actually possible. Yeah, because yeah. up until that point, there was nothing and only mm. failed attempts. So I'm getting yeah. worried. Um, so we arrive on, so long story short, again, we arrive on the Bering Strait. No one had ever made it from America. 
the year before us, two guys had tried it, uh, Dixie Dancer and uh, what's the other guys, um, Mark or something. An American guy, he'd done Everest or K2, something like that. He was a big mountaineer. Dixie Dancer had done North Pole, South Pole, kind of unsupported, real polar explorer. These two guys were, were pros. They had all the sponsorship, a lot of money, and they they stepped onto the Bering Strait and they got dragged south for like six days before they were rescued. They made no progress west at all. Wow! And that was the professionals. Yeah. Um, so we we sat we we met um, with the American guy in um, in Anchorage and we sat down. We had this, you know, we talked talked things talked about their experiences and what they would have done differently and whatnot. So we had a lot of input from the guys. Um, and that's when we came up with our plan, which was just going to have to be, we decided that, you know, this whole thing had to be a lot more aggressive, lighter, faster. Um, and we had to be able to operate in the water as, as comfortably as out of the water. So we had to become basically marine sea mammals, yeah, Arctic marine sea mammals in order to do this. Because by you know, trying to avoid the water, uh, hopping back and forth on the ice, it just wasn't, it didn't seem practical at all. Yeah. That so it's going to have to be, you got to go, you got to go straight, you got to go hard, you got to go in and out of that water. I mean, that's the way, that's the way we planned it and designed it. And that's how we did it. You were being filmed as well, weren't you, at that time for the, by yeah, like the a BBC little BBC. Were, yeah. The BBC did a documentary. Yeah. So they, they'd picked up on me somewhere back down in Canada and they'd come out a few times. I'll try and put we'll the links to... to that in the, the description because yeah. I, I watched that the other day. Um, in fact, there was a quote by one of the locals that lives around there, like near Wales. Yeah. And he said, uh, he's like, you, you can't fight Mother Nature. Too strong out here. Very dangerous. They'll be rescued. I know that. That was his. That was yeah. what he had to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. So That's what everyone was saying. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this guy apparently had tried it and like, he, yeah, he lives there and like he had to be rescued himself, I think, years before and all that kind of so it's a wild, yeah. wild thing that you're trying right. to do there. Yeah, it's impossible. So, like, for example, I did not expect to make it the first time. I was not convinced it was going to happen, right? So in my own mind, my main concern was, A, getting off that Bering Strait alive, and B, how the hell I was going to afford the second attempt. Mm. Because my, I, I truly thought that we were going to hit this thing, bounce off like a brick, like a brick wall. Um, we, it was going to be a learning process, right? So each time we tried it, we were going to get an ass whooping, but we were going to get better at it and figure this thing out. But I just didn't know how I was going to afford to do this because it was getting really expensive. It was mm. sinking like tens of thousands of dollars into this thing. Um, and that was pretty much where it stood. And I, we were willing to give it our best go, but that's the thing. And um, we'd been on the ice like two days, and I thought it was already over because we'd, we'd got, we'd swum out there onto the ice. We were getting dragged north. Uh, like two miles an hour or something. We're making no progress west. Uh, we were stuck in just this unimaginable soup-like slush. Couldn't make any progress. And these things were looking really bad. And then conditions suddenly changed. The ice stopped moving. And then, because I remember at one point being in the tent watching the GPS just ticking as we're just moving and moving. And it slowed and then started going into reverse. And so we started coming back down. Mm. So it kind of brought us back down. And at this point, the temperatures were quite warm, like it was almost zero degrees Celsius. So it's very warm. It's, it's March, so things are getting warm. And um, the, so the, the sea ice was very soft. A lot of ice wasn't there, a lot of open water. And then the temperature plummeted to like minus 32, 34. And it, it, it put a, a surface on the sea ice, mm. which was just an absolute godsend. And then, and then the, the, the wind stopped. And this is one of, like, one of the windiest places in the world. And then the wind just kind of went away. And it was literally like being Moses watching the Red Sea part. I mean, it was a freaking miracle. Um, yeah. It was just the best kind of conditions you could hope for. And sure enough, we were able to start making progress. And so with the waves parted, we, we started making progress. We, we managed to get across that border, put us into Russia. But then things started going back south again. Well, we couldn't, we had to turn south to get to the Russian coastline, but now we were on what we call negative drift. So for all the progress we're making south, we're losing during the, during the night. So we're not we're kind of, you know, on a treadmill uh, and we're getting tired and there's yeah. a weather system coming in from the south. 
and things weren't looking good. We started getting desperate, ditched a ton of equipment, we threw almost half of our equipment away. And then eventually um, we had this one good day, which we'd like, we did like 11 kilometers or something, and which put the Russian coastline within striking distance the next day. One more good day. And uh, yeah, that was it. We actually we arrived on the Russian coast and that was the first time anyone had ever walked from North America into Russia. Wow. And the Russians yeah. were not impressed. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna, we'll have to get onto their uh, their reaction in a second. Um, what was the hardest though? Or what like out of the, the Darien Gap and the Bering Strait? Like obviously they're two completely different things, but what was like more physically demanding and, and what was maybe more mentally demanding? Um, right, yeah. Personally, the Darien Gap. Yeah, on both of those, yeah, mentally and physically. Yeah, it broke me. I mean, the yeah. Darien Gap. I remember when I reached the border with Panama. I remember sitting down. I've been so sick and so exhausted. I remember just weeping like a child. Yeah, like for a little while, like I was done, mm. and it was just a nerve-wracking experience. But it it just beat the shit out of me. And uh, we never got to that point on the on the Bering Strait. Bering Strait was like you know fourteen days altogether. I think it was. It was tough. Um, but it never, we never, I never got to the point where, you know, I thought things were that bad. Um, a couple of incidents, scary incidents, but other than that, it wasn't that bad at all. You know, we, it was always just there. The, the weather was on our side, like I just said. Yeah. How effective were the immersion suits? They were great. So do you yeah. do you, do yeah. you feel yeah. the cold water and then it warms up? Is it kind of like a wetsuit or is it nothing gets in there, nothing the, touches the, you? The water doesn't get in. Um, the biggest problem we had was not sweating. Uh, mm. It's hard work in that water. And yeah. The biggest problem is because if, if you start to sweat, that sweat freezes on the inside and that just nails any insulation. Mm. Um, so the, the hardest thing is to keep ventilated, not, not to sweat in those suits. Because wow. in that water, yeah, you're busting your balls in that water trying to mm. move in that water because sometimes you're just in, like you saw the video where you're just in that kind of soup effect where the, yeah. you're just stuck in a, a giant slurpee and yeah. you're just fighting and getting nowhere kind of thing and then all the time hauling that those you know what was a 400 pound sled up basically the side of a cliff to get mm. up those chunks always climbing it was all upper body strength which i don't think we were ready for it was just how much upper body strength it was you know you needed on the straights yeah um so that was pretty exhausting. But yeah, the, the suits are fantastic. They worked absolutely great. And those those blue suits were um, they were special uh, Navy, U.S. Navy rescue dive swimmers or something. Mm. They used to use kind of special forces gear. And they were really tough. And they were great. They were fantastic. Yeah, it was just sealed around the neck and everything else was just clip-on gloves. And that was it. Yeah, wow. So your face is like freezing, but you, the rest of you, you're fighting to not get too hot rather than not get too cold yeah, while yeah. while you're moving, right. I suppose. Yeah. And I guess the hardest bits looks like the fact that you're constantly in and then out and then in and then out and then, you know, and then yeah, you're in, but exactly. it's not really water. It's kind of like you say, it's this slush with bits with massive chunks of ice and, and yeah, they just, it looks insane. It looks so and the the film crew that were filming you they at one point they thought you died right they uh they they couldn't see you they yeah, they took yeah. a helicopter <laughs> they tried to see you in a helicopter they're like they're in bright colored clothing we should be able to see them we can't see them i think that was the right. moment you talked about where you where you went 30 miles or whatever up uh up the coast um, yeah 50 miles we got dragged 50 miles up the coast like just like that it just whipped us not and they, they they had no chance of finding us we were gone and um, apparently yeah. they were saying that I was supposed to check in on the sat phone, but I didn't know I was supposed to check in with them. I might remember that in the plan, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it all made it, it all made good drama. Yeah, oh yeah, it did. You can see the way that they're like acting. You can see they do kind of think you may well be dead at that point. They're like they're they're, they're like not <laughs> yeah. they're not feeling it. They're not feeling good at that point. They're, they're, um yeah I'll, I'll like i say i'll try and put the link in the description and uh and and the link to the, to another bit as well that i'm sure we're going to touch on in a minute so russia's reaction um when you arrive uh you're like hello we're here yeah um how did that go down yeah <laughs> not well um uh, yeah and i think we had to kind of backtrack it was the planning well we're putting this thing together we needed two things we needed obviously a russian visa 
And then we needed something called a propusk, which is like a special document for that part of Russia. Because of its proximity to the evil empire, it's, it's a really restricted military zone. So you need permission mm. to be in there. But we couldn't get any information about this propusk. We had no idea how to get our hands on this thing. And we were kind of running out of time at this point. And we went to um, a special travel agency in Seattle, Washington. Me and Dimitri went down there specifically to talk to them, to give them a bare and straight plan, hand over our passports, because they, they said they could get us the visas with the bare and straight plan. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we left that office, and those guys in the office were like, well, those fucking idiots obviously ain't going across the Bering Strait, right? They're obviously high on drugs or something. So they completely ignored us, and they made up their own entry plan into Russia, telling the Russians that we'd fly into Vladivostok or something like that. Um, obviously, we got the visas. They gave us our passports and our Russian visas back. Didn't tell us they changed anything, right? So we are now assuming... The Russians had seen our plan to come across the Bering Strait and given us the visas. So we're halfway there, right? Great. Um, as for this purpose thing, uh, we're not getting it. So, and this was one of the coldest winters in like 40 years. So we had the best opportunity, we had the best ice conditions. And so if we're going to do this, remembering that I actually didn't believe we were going to make it anyway. So I wasn't that concerned about the propusk. Um, if we made it, then we'd have to come back to Alaska to sort out the paperwork to be able to continue. But that was really at the back of my mind. That was just wasn't an issue for me because we're faced with the, the Bering Strait. Mm. Uh, and I'm just worried about coming off it alive and figuring out how we're going to do this next year, how I was going to learn from this. Um, and we ended up in Russia. So... And then it turns out that once we were picked up by the Russians and the FSB got involved, and it turned out that the the passports obviously were not true. The visas were were fake or false. Um, So their suspicions went through the roof. We said we walked across the Bering Straits. They were like, bullshit. (laughs) No one's walked across the Bering Straits. You you were just dropped off by a submarine. Um, And they actually took Dimitri on an armored vehicle at one point. Um, we had to go show them where we came ashore. They were looking for evidence that we come ashore by a submarine. And they they just went to town on us after that. They just kind of, we were basically, uh, you know, took everything off of us. A lot of interviews without coffee and with coffee. Mm. And then they stuck us in a village on the coast there on the Bering Strait. And no passports, no equipment. And we had set a fend fen for ourselves. But it was kind of like a, a village prison, if you like. Um, went to court eventually. It was a ridiculous situation. No one understood anything we were saying. And they, they, they basically found us guilty of um, administrative um, issues. Um, so like crossing the border at, without a uh, entry point. And a couple of administrative things. The, the Russian border guards wanted us to go to jail. Uh, that's what they were pushing for. Um, and then with this, this we were going to get deported. We were fined a tiny amount of money. And then there was a, the opportunity for a retrial. Obviously, we took a retrial because um, I didn't want to get deport, deported, the visa ban. Mm. And then the, the press, everything, everybody got in. Then all of a sudden, it just hit the press, hit the headlines. And everybody, we had press from all over the world trying to get involved. And uh, there was a spotlight on the area then. And the governor of Chukotka was um, a guy called Abramovich, one of these oligarchs. And Abramovich the owns same, Chelsea Football Club. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. right. He's the governor of that region. And he, so he has ties with the UK. And at the time, it was the, the deputy prime minister was John Prescott, who was the MP for Hull. Mm. Oh, right. So, I, so my, my stars were kind of aligned <laughs> there. Yeah. So at some point, those two had a conversation. And uh, decided that uh, they were going to give cut me some slack and let me carry on. Yeah. But this kind yeah. of went 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 in the face of the FSB and um, the border guards, the security apparatus, as it was, who had pretty much convinced themselves I was something I wasn't supposed to be. Mm. So they were just all over me, and they'd, they'd found all kinds of stuff on my laptop, all, all you know, all the way up through like North America. I'd, I'd connected with the military on some level, 
Like I had a couple of low-level sponsors that had military contracts. And there's, there's me meeting U.S. soldiers far on a firing range with all these pimped-out weapons with silencers and stuff. And it just looked not great, yeah. <laughs> plus my background. And there was just all this kind of this stuff, even in Alaska. And so the Russians had taken all my equipment, gone through my laptop, and they'd, taken, and they'd printed out all these images, and they would meet me regularly. I would have to go for these interviews and they'd be like, okay, what's this? Explain that. And who's this? Explain this. And, you know, we know who you are. Kind of thing. <laughs> and it was great. Sometimes they would take you out. Their, their method was three FSB agents would take you downtown in Anada, which is the capital of that region. And they would just buy the most expensive vodka, the most expensive wine, and just get you hammered. And they would get hammered. And then they would just hash, you know, they just keep on it, just trying to trick you up, trying to figure out, you know, but they would get hammered, and then they would get hammered, and then they would lean over the table going, oh, we know, we know who you are. <laughs> You're a reconnaissance specialist. That's who you are. And you're like, holy shit. And so at, at one point, it got kind of scary. Cause, yeah. And there was all these subtle, there was these subtle threats. There was all these things like, you know, if you disappeared in the tundra, no one would ever know why. No one's going to know. You could just disappear tomorrow and no one's going to know why or anything, right? And they just keep saying these things, just like, fuck. And these guys would. I mean, this is the problem. I mean, these, these, you know, they take out journalists downtown in Moscow. I mean, if they really do think I'm, I'm a threat, mm. holy shit. Yeah. So there was a couple, there was, it was no, it was rough times in, in um, and, and, you know, these were young FSB agents. And I knew one of them pretty well because he actually got the job in the FSB because he, he acted as a translator when we first crossed the Bering Straits. Mm. Um, he used to work for local government, but they'd seen how well he performed during these interviews that we were, being, we were having with us and, how, and then offered him a job in the FSB. And then he became my handler mm. when I would go back because we'd be in and out of Russia. Um, so, yeah, I was... And, and so the FSB was on my case... Uh, and that was that was a it was pretty rough, very very worrying. Yeah. Um, and then eventually, at one point, while we're trying to get through Russia, they they kind of jumped me um, on the track and picked, took me off the track, told me I'd crossed out into a restricted border zone close to the northern coastline. Um, and then the next time I tried to go back, they hit me with a visa ban, and that's why I ended up crossing America. Mm. Um, we ended up with my sponsors. The only way we could figure out, try and challenge this visa ban was to walk from my sponsor's base in Los Angeles to the Russian embassy in DC while we put together some kind of media campaign. How many miles was and it? I, I, three and a half thousand or something, wasn't it? Yeah, 3,500 miles, yeah. A yeah. year, it took, us, it took us a year. It was great. And that was just on the side. Um, it's not part of the walking around. The world. Well, it was just, just on the yeah. side. I mean, I remember... <laughs> It was my sponsor that came up with the idea because, you know, we'd spent a year trying to go through these political channels and just was getting completely blanked yeah. by, the, uh, by the Russians. And we were, at a, we were at a dead end. And then my sponsor just came up with this crazy idea when he first said, well, let's walk to the Russian embassy. And I just laughed. I was just like, well, no. <laughs> I'm not walking 3,000 3, miles in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah. That's ridiculous. You yeah. know, yeah. Everything, everything in my body was against doing something like that. But, you know, it, it, it didn't take long before I realized that there's no, there's no other option here. We've got to do something. So they made this whole campaign out of it, got funded by Nat Geo. Yeah. And um, it worked. It worked. And this is the thing. I just couldn't believe it, but it worked. Because we knew the, the ban come from the FSB. I mean, literally from Putin's boys. Uh, you know, this, this was his guys. So I, I couldn't imagine overturning that visa ban. And like we said earlier on about the luck of the gods, um, how, how many of these things I got away with, I don't know. But um, but this one was the classic. And um, literally, the uh, I think it was, um, I can't remember who it was now, the Washington Post, I think, rang a big story. And someone at the embassy saw it. And then they reached out to us and said, yeah, come on in. Yeah. I'll give you a visa. Yeah. And it was just like that. I was like, holy shit. <laughs> so we got the visa, went back into Russia, and the FSB never appeared again. They left it's me crazy. alone. That's crazy. And then I was able to get off the tundra, get all the way down, and next thing you know, I'm walking into Mongolia. 
That's the documentary as well, isn't it, by the way? The Walking Across America and that Geo documentary, which again, I'll try, I'll put the link yeah. in the description, hopefully. Yeah. So just scroll down, it's, it's, yeah. it's a good watch. So then you went through across, yeah, what, 1500 miles of tundra? Um, something like well, that. It took years. Yeah. It took years. To, I mean, it was half the time I've been on the road was just trying to get through Russia. Yeah. And again, a lot of that was because the Russians would only give me three months at a time on a visa. So and it, and at one point we were we were restricted to winter travel only mm. in um, in these in this uh, you know on the tundra until we could get to the first road system. So yeah, it was just painful to get out of Russia. It took forever. Mm. And the most oh, and halfway through there we had the um, financial crisis. And this is before I have my sponsors right now. So at one point um, I, I'd left Russia. The financial crisis hit. I lost all my sponsors. Um, and ended up stuck in Mexico for the first time mm. for like two and a half years, uh, unable to find. Obviously, you know, after 2008 crisis, there was no one with any spare cash mm. for, for something like this. So, yeah, that was a pretty dark time as well. Until eventually, I found one of my sponsors. These guys from Los Angeles found me. Yeah, so I guess Got you could have gone home in that gap, but that would have been breaking rule rule one, wouldn't it? So, so uh, you yeah, stayed away. One. I can't go home until I arrive in foot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's just two two rules. Yeah, rule rule one is you can't go home until until you get there, and rule two is it's got to be on foot. Yeah, I can't I can't go home until I arrive on foot. And rule two is is that I can't use any form of transport. It's just emphasizing the on yeah. foot is rule two, isn't it? It's just underlining yeah, the. Yeah, uh... <laughs> I've got to get. I've got to get. If I advance, it's got to be on foot. I can't use anything like a boat, plane, train, cars, bikes, anything, anything that you might class as transport. Which kind of you know at, at the time sound pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, once you start getting, you know, into all this geopolitics and shit, it's just, it comes in my head. So when I can't move, but then I have to hunker down somewhere. And then I've got to play this game where you're bouncing around different countries, working on these short-term visa plans. Yeah. Trying to figure out how to survive and then trying to figure out how to get back on the road. Um, I, you know, it's easier, a lot easier now because I have some good sponsors. But, um, mm. but you know, we've seen it all. Visa bans, financial crises, and now a pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, yeah. It, you you must have. I mean, you've been on the road like nearly a quarter of a century, haven't you? Uh, it's it's crazy. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I started I started last century. Literally. Yeah, <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> last millennium, in fact. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's wild. It is wild. I mean, yeah. I bet you. I bet you never kind of considered that when when you were planning it. Like, oh, what if I'm still on the road in like 22 years or whatever? No. Um, it's just. No, uh, it's, it's amazing. Ridiculous. But you've seen so much. We could talk for hours. I mean, what I'll do to finish it out, I'll ask you a few kind of quickish questions, quick fireish questions. And all I mean by that, it doesn't mean you can't reply with something longer. It just, there's no pressure to do so. You can kind of keep it brief if you want. Before I do that though, maybe just kind of, can you wrap up a little bit kind of where you are in the expedition now? Like what's the latest and and that kind of stuff? What's the the future plans? Yeah. So down through uh, Mongolia, uh, some interesting times in Mongolia, then into China. Very interesting times in China, that Xinjiang province. Um, and then, again, lucky I could do that. And then Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, and then we got um, Turkmenistan and ended up on the border with Iran. Um, but I arrived on the border with Iran and just at the time that the US and Iran were starting to butt heads and the Iranians had just kind of hit those Saudi oil refineries or the Hutu guerrillas had hit the oil refineries. So there was a very tense standoff with the West and Iran. Things weren't looking good. I had to leave Turkmenistan. Um, I returned to Los Angeles to, to meet my sponsors to plan the next stage of where we're we going to go next. How are you going to do this? And then the Americans killed Suleimani. Suleimani. Um, they dropped that um, hellfire on him. In Baghdad, and then the next thing you know, the Iranians are firing missiles at the Americans, and things were not looking good at all. So our plans got waylaid. We ended up waiting. We'd found a contact in Iran who could help us with the visas. Very difficult to get into Iran on a British passport. Um, but things weren't looking good. And then once that started to calm down, pandemic stepped in. And Iran was like the first country outside of China to get knocked sideways by this thing. Mm. Uh, so, and that's been it, you know. That's been it since then. Yeah. Now, 
every time we want to go back, I can't go back to Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan. All my equipment is in Turkmenistan in someone's garden oh, between wow. a goat shed and the, and the chicken pen. <laughs> I have no idea what kind of state that's in by now, but all my stuff's <laughs> there. Apparently it's still there. Um, but I can't get back into Turkmenistan. And I have two route options available to me south of the Caspian Sea. Somehow we'd have to get into Iran. Not looking good. And the only other option is to go north of the Caspian. That means getting back into Russia. Mm. Now, Russia doesn't like me. And I tried to visa, do a visa bounce into um, Kyrgyzstan, and they wouldn't let me in. The only country that's ever denied me end access, and that mm. was because of what happened in Russia. Apparently, they have some kind of um, security pact with Russia. Um, and if they wouldn't let me in because of what happened in Russia, I don't know if the Russians are going to let me back in. Mm. So at the moment, it's rocking a hard place. Yeah. Right. And that's we're not we're not even talking about the pandemic yet. So that's you know. Yeah. 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 So it's like everything's up in the air, just totally. Yeah. Uh... It's, it's pretty right now. I feel like I'm in the toughest corner I've been in since I started this thing, mm. and it's mostly politics. And right now, with the geopolitics, in you know, with the Russians on the border with the Ukraine, the way they are. As soon as I'm starting to think about going back in, is about the time that they should be invading the Ukraine. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then you know it's just going to be a shit show. Uh, so the pol- geopolitics isn't going to help me at all out in that regard. Um, and things aren't exactly great between the UK and Iran either. So having a, a UK passport right now is just not working for me. Mm. Is there any way you break rule number one? Is there any scenario where, like, no. if, if you're still if you're still sitting there in a decade and things haven't changed, I, I obviously I don't want to, you know, I'm sure it's going to turn out. Um, but if if things go to shit and you're still sitting there in five ten years, like, would you, so there's no point where you'd be like, oh, like, I have to I have to go home. Wouldn't do it. Well, A, I'll be too old, but I'll need a wheelchair. I'll be that old by that stage, I'll need a wheelchair and I can't freaking walk. But um, no, I mean, right now, um, we just got to figure this one out. I mean, there is there is another option. The, that option would involve swimming the Caspian Sea. How long is the Caspian is Sea? Well, the shortest, the shortest um, route looks like about 250 miles. Wow. Yeah. I could barely swim in a bathtub right now. I don't know about <laughs> swimming the Caspian Sea. So, so there's the three options, shall we say? Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of options to come before Rule One gets gets touched. Um, it's not over yet. Yeah. Just say that. Yeah. Well, you you've got through uh, you've got through quite a bit so far to get to this point. So yeah, I think it, like you I think you said in one of these documentaries that I watched, it would be harder at this point to to give up and to go home than to finish yeah. it and i completely see where you're coming sure. from i completely get that like the amount you've put into it at this point it's like your life uh at least half of it uh, and then so yeah if you yeah it just you can't even comprehend the the, the idea of, of yeah just going home yeah i get that yeah we've got you know we're gonna have to suck it up right now we're gonna have to wait for this pandemic to sort itself out we're gonna wait for these borders to open and then we've got to speak to people nicely and we've got to do the best we can and we'll see yeah well, I'll be I'll be rooting right for you for sure. Yeah, yeah. I hope it hope it gets going soon. Um, so then, yeah. Let me just ask you a few kind of more random questions, a little bit all over the place for a minute. Yeah. And uh, like, I, I'm really interested to know the the best. So, what is the best food in the world? You're probably better. You're in a better place to say this officially than anybody else. So, the best food in the world, worst food in the world, according to Carl Bushby. I'm a seafood guy. Um, you know, I mean, I remember just. The ones that stand out the most are probably going to be along the coast of Peru, especially being a seafood guy. I don't know. The ceviches, the Peruvian ceviches were just magical. Um, and it really depends, you know, because you can give, you can be in such a bad state without any food and money. And that freaking mango from a tree mm. is just the most heavenly thing. It will blow your mind. It really depends on just how hungry you are. Yeah. Because you will eat, you will eat shit. If you're that hungry. You <laughs> yeah. just will. You just, you... And it will taste amazing. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, so, you know, I mean, I've eaten some things. The worst thing, I think the worst thing I've ever tasted has got to be seal. It's got to be seal flesh, seal mm. blubber, seal oil, and whale 
Well, what was it about it, it? The texture or? Oh, it's like drinking gasoline. I don't get it at all. Especially oh, the yeah. white, the sea oil. It's yeah. just rough. Um, there's that. Yeah, I think that stands out as being some of the worst stuff I've had. Yeah. You know, when you're in the jungles and things like that, people will give you food, but everything's soup. So yeah. you never know what you're eating, which is probably really good. That's, <laughs> that's the way normally they eat it in these countries. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's super-fried and it's, it's spicy-fried and you have no idea what you're eating. <laughs> but it's food. That's probably it's food. <laughs> they don't care. It's all good. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you about the moment like where you were most scared, like most afraid, I guess, for your life or whatever, whatever the fear was of. But I'm supposing since we've had this conversation now, I'm supposing it was in the, the Darien Gap at some point. Um, oh, but I guess it could have been in Russia. It could have. There's a lot. You can, I guess you've got a lot to draw from. There's a lot. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of incidents where things got pretty hairy, um, especially in Alaska as well. Uh, you know, we skipped a couple of stories there where I thought, shit, here we are, it's all good, could be over. Um, so there's been a few, you know, in the Darien Gap, yeah, it's an obvious one, but uh, there's been a couple. So a couple of times I've thought to myself, this looks really, really bad. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, all you got all through good. it each time so far. Yeah. Um, what about animals? Like, I, I was wondering, animal encounters. You must have had some encounters with, like, some wild animals at this point, or, I don't know, had some run-ins. Is that, is, have you ever? Like, uh, you know, you traveled through jungles no, where there's jag really. jaguars and stuff like that. and No, because all that stuff avoids you. You'll be lucky yeah. if you see them. The wolves, yeah. in, like, you know, I've managed to get glimpses of wolves up north. Very rarely you'll be lucky to see those. Down south, the snakes and things. Most things avoid you. Any polar bears in the uh, like the Bering Strait? Polar bears, yeah, yeah. We met we met the polar bears a few times. Yeah. And uh, once we met nose to nose with a polar bear coming our way, he saw us, stopped, looked at us, and just bugged out. And I remember once the scariest one was when me and Dimitri were together in Russia along the coastline again, and we were stuck between a huge cliff, piles of sea ice, and there's a thin strip, and there's a polar bear in the, in the middle in front of us and he's digging at something and we're, we're inching a bit closer and he's still digging and he can see, he's looking at us oh my god shit you know we can't go around him we've got to keep inching forward and hope he goes away and then um, the russians wouldn't let us carry flares mm. so we we bought some fireworks from a town and they were and you know we so we got our fireworks out like, let's test them and they were like Psst. oh my god this feels, you know, everything feels so <laughs> inadequate right now like if this bear wants us we're dead and yeah. I remember at one point the polar we got closer and closer and I'm like, oh, this isn't this isn't good. And then the polar bear stood up, which is just the freakiest thing because it'll go from something that looks like his dog size down there in the ground, and then it just rose up and just like it stood on its legs and just rose into the air. And we're just like looking up at this thing as it just went up and up and up, freaking huge. And it just stood up to get a look at us, and it just kind of looked at us for a little while like that, and we're like, holy shit. Yeah. And then it just kind of like turned, turned around and wandered off back into the, the sea ice. And we're like, holy crap! Like I mean, we, we were nothing compared to this thing. Like it wouldn't, it would finish with it in seconds. Yeah, it, it would. We, you know, it was just an immense size. And uh, yeah, they can be scary. And they they do attack and eat people. And the Russians got like you know four to albums of oh, really? half eaten human beings and shit. Oh, god. oh my god. Which they love to show you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, they'll 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 take you on. And that that was one of our big my biggest fears on the Bering Strait was the polar bears. Yeah. Like the um, the guy that the guy that made it the Russians that made it across the Bering Strait, the Dmitry Sparrow and his son. You know, at one point they um, a polar bear took down half their tent on one of their attempts, and they had to fight it off with a handgun. Uh, so we were tooled up. We wow. were expecting all these guys we got, we got i saw on that bbc documentary thing yeah they they kind of like hooked you up with this this guy who was supposed to i guess scare the shit out of you so that you didn't go and walk into a polar bear's uh everybody's and, uh, scared the shit out of you. everyone so, has a polar bear story up north. you were trying to say yeah. like oh, like oh you know we'll be all right we'll, we'll be okay we'll, and he's like yeah but you might not they're fast yeah. and stuff like that <laughs> and you're like it's it's true stop it yeah. yeah it's it's like one of the reasons we had night vision equipment was in case we had to move at night uh we it was all about polar bears it was like because if they get within a certain range of you that's it 
Yeah. Like, there's no getting away. And they're, they're the only, you know, large land carnivore that will actively hunt human beings. Mm. They're the only ones right now. Yeah. On, on that street, they'll see you as food. So you've got to be really careful. So we got that night vision just for the extra standoff in the dark. Yeah. So that they, uh, oh. The idea of being hunted when you're already in such an inhospitable environment is is pretty terrifying. I have yeah, to yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're they're a real worry, and you, you you need special ammunition for your gun as well. Mm. Like just just a bullet won't stop a bird. Wow. Like you need you need anti tank rounds to stop yeah. those things. Yeah, and you, you there's nowhere to run, there's nowhere to hide. There's you no, know, literally no. it's crazy. Um, are there any other like uh, you know highs or lows or successes, failures, things like that that we haven't touched on that that's worth mentioning that you'd you'd want to yeah. share? You know, there's highs and lows. I mean, I guess there's you know the highs would be actually making it across the Bering Straits, making it to the Darien Gap, mm. uh, making it through China, you not know, getting thrown out. Um, so I mean, it's all that. Those are the highs, the lows. That's mostly women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's mostly broken hearts yeah a lot of that and then and then you know like i said we've been i've been very lucky we you know i had no major disasters the closest i probably come to it was was right back down in patagonia where i cut my wrist and ended up shooting blood into the desert but i'd nicked the artery not severed an artery mm. um so i got lucky because i was in the middle of nowhere um uh, that was luck the fact that nothing's hit me on the roads it's amazing because yeah. Central America was just a nightmare. Yeah. Um, so I've been I've been really lucky. You know, no main, no big diseases. Yeah, definitely. Would you say Let's after just the? Just hope what that, that carries on. Yeah. Let's just hope we'll get the next two years in. Yeah, exactly. Um, I know you've probably experienced like every emotion since you started, but has it been? fun like over the whole the whole time the over the overall overarching thing have you had fun have you had enough fun to warrant like uh what you've done <laughs> i mean fun isn't isn't the biggest part of it. it even if it wasn't i think we've had it's a good time i mean it's just yeah. ex- it's just a life of experiences uh i mean at times it's just been brutal yeah for a long period of time and but overall, no, I mean, it's just, just, just the most incredible experience, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm just so fortunate to have the chance to do this um, and, and, and figure out how to do it. You know, I've got, and it's, you know, it's people backing me, you know, it's people all the way from, from day one. Um, locals have looked after me, locals have fed me, locals have nursed me back to health uh, when I was sick. And you owe those people so much. You know, they're all, that's my support team is a global Mm. organization run by humanity um you know my parents helped me through the worst of it um uh, no sponsors that come along at just the right time and save your ass mm. yeah you know and and it's been the same every country i've been to has been this, i've had the same generosity from russia central asia china you name it throughout the americas yeah even north america <laughs> yeah amazing people and that's and that's something that i think really hits home as well you really realize just you know because you look at the world through the lens of the 24-hour news cycle and you would you know why would you ever leave your house Mm. it's a horrifying world but in reality it's um it's not at all it's an amazing world uh and people are just you know 99.99999 percent good people it's just that tiny little percentage of the ones in power i guess (laughs) Yeah, you just need one of those lunatics and a gun, and then that'll end everything. So, yeah, yeah. Despite how how optimistic I can be and how good I think people are, you, I'm always on my best behavior, and I'm always aware of the fact that it doesn't take it takes a second, one idiot and a second, one one drunk idiot in a car, or just one asshole and a gun and then hype, and that's it. It's all over. Yeah. Um, and for you, that's but, all been you know the message. Sorry, go on. Yeah. But the message here, though, is the fact that it is an amazing world, and everybody's generally just they're beautiful people out there. Yeah, and you should, you certainly should not be afraid to travel. You know, and I, I meet them. I meet, meet mothers who are hysterical because the kids want to go abroad for the first time or something after school. But I mean, there's no greater learning experience as well getting out there and seeing the rest of the world. Yeah. It'll change no matter who you are, where you're from, it's going to change your perspective on life. So how has it changed your perspective on life and on humanity? 
It has a great deal, yeah. I mean, coming from the army, especially, you know, having spent a couple of years in Northern Ireland, I haven't seen the best of humanity. Um, and then you get out there, and it's humbling. It really is humbling. Um, which is, you know, and I get the pleasure of standing up in front of classes of school kids on a regular basis and talk to them about this and, you know, making sure I get that point across that no matter the crap that you're seeing on TV, it truly is an amazing world. And like I said, 99.99999% of everyone you all meet is amazing. Mm. And you'll get shown, I guess, things on TV that doesn't really portray what the people are like in a given place and things like that. And it's oh, easy for okay. people to say, oh, look, they're different to us. They do that differently. I don't like them. Fuck them. But in fact, yeah, like you right. said, you've seen it firsthand that we're all actually a lot more similar. Cultural, yeah, those cultural layers are pretty thin at times. Um, yeah. You know, once you break down those barriers, you have to spend long with people. Same things make us laugh. Same things make us cry. Yeah. You all want the same at the end of the day. You know, we're all headed in the same direction. Um, so, yeah, it, it, you know, if you're just a reasonable human being, it's, I get along with everybody on the road. Yeah. It doesn't matter what culture or religious background. I think everybody needs to remember that, yeah, that there's a lot more that, that uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a lot more that kind of brings us together than divides us, you know? Um, like different different races, people from different countries. At the end of the day, we're also kind of obsessed with, you know, you've got to be patriotic and your country and all this kind of thing. And, and that's obviously like with the army and things like that, it's all about that. But for me, at least at the end of the day, a country is no different to like uh, villages in, within a country. It's just a place. It's just somewhere you're from. You know, it doesn't, doesn't define you as a person or anything like that. It's such a small, irrelevant part of the bigger picture. Mm. And I think that's one thing about when you step out of your small circle, your, 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 your friends, your home, the bar, your workplace. Once you get out of that and you start expanding those circles, it's going to change everything. It's going to change your perspective of humanity. Yeah. And you can't go back down. And to watch, you know, countries fight on the levels that they do about the things that they fight about, it's it's yeah it's annoying and embarrassing to some extent um but it's reality um uh, and it's it's disappointing shall we say mm. i'm not angry i'm just disappointed with the world yeah that's all yeah very very disappointed um yeah because we're generally uh, speaking fighting over money and stuff aren't we that's the the biggest thing it's fighting over freaking anything yeah it's fighting over flags it's fighting over uh, half an inch of ground we're willing to die um half of it just doesn't make any sense at all but um in the bigger picture anyway yeah but hey st still going forward hasn't stopped us yet so no absolutely absolutely um all right one last question then before i all kind of try and round this out so i would i'd be remiss if i didn't if i didn't mention this i mean you've spent 20 odd years now walking around outside you must have looked at the sky quite a lot and I just have to check if you've seen anything weird in the sky. Any UFOs, Carl? Yes. Yes? Yes. Come on, in the then. deserts of... Indulge of, me. Of, uh, deserts of uh, Chile. Um, midday. And there's midday. A, a, a desert, a couple of mountains. And then there's a white orb orbiting in front of me on the road. Very large. And it was just a pulsating light that was just hovering in the, over the desert right in front of me um so yeah that was kind of freaking me out and i got closer and closer and just stayed there in the air for maybe half an hour wow uh, just this oscillating bright white light yeah just changing shape just flashing and then eventually i got close enough and it was a plastic bag <laughs> caught in a vortex wow that's crazy that's my ufo story damn it, damn it. and it was just a plastic bag <laughs> and it was just it was in like a saddle yeah some high ground and it was just caught in it, and because of the sun reflecting off it as it rotated in this caught in the air, it was just looked like it was an oscillating shape of yeah. distance. And it was so bright because it's this white plastic bag that it looked ten times larger than it should have wow. been. Wow. And so for a minute you had that kind of like that heart moment where you're like, Oh shit, like this the, is weird. The old heart tickle was kicking, and I'm like, holy, I I can't explain this. Yeah. Like this is beyond me. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I am a rational guy, I don't believe in this shit, but right now. <laughs> What the hell is going on? What is that? It's just staying there in the sky in front of me. It's not going away. It was there for a long time, and it's a white plastic bag. Yeah. It's, 
Wow, that's not bad. That's that's, that's it's a good story at least. <laughs> any any others, or is that the is that the one? <laughs> that's it. I, I'm not a believer, so you know I don't. You know, that's the only time that I've been tested, shall we say? Yeah. Now it would have been interesting to if I if I'd have passed by in a car or something. If I had been a lot less skeptical than I am, um, there's no way I could have explained that. You know, yeah. and that's. I think where most of us are. Yeah. Never in a million years would you have come to a white plastic bag for the vortex. No, no. It's obviously a freaking UFO. <laughs> there is no way that is explainable. Yeah. It's a white plastic bag in the vortex. And that is it. Yeah. Um, but look, this was yeah. uh this was awesome. Um to round it out, I'd love it if you if you have any words that you'd like to share with anybody watching or listening. Just like a, kind of a message. It doesn't have to be anything particularly sentimental. It can be whatever you want to say. Um, but the floor is yours. No, well, I mean, um, first of all, two people thinking about traveling, do it. Don't hesitate. If you have kids that want to go travel, it is in your best interest to get them out there. Even if they don't want to go traveling, make them. <laughs> um, you really should. It, it will change everything in their lives. They will become better human beings for it and hopefully convinced. Do not be afraid to get out there and see the world. Uh, we should all be doing a hell of a lot more of that. Um, you know, thanks to everyone who out there in the world that's helped me, got me to where I am, because it is not a one-man mission. Yeah. To say it takes a village is the least of it. Yeah, it takes it's a world. It's taken a world to get me here. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. From, from every country. Yeah. No, it's awesome. So that would be, you know, where end of the day, I would say yeah, that's my thanks. Thanks to everybody. Thanks and get out there. Well, thank you for today, Carl. I really appreciate this. This was awesome. Um, so many interesting Pleasure. stories and we probably left so many on the table. Maybe for another time when we have a better signal one day. <laughs> it didn't do too bad. It didn't. No, it, it held it up dropped, okay. It dropped out once or twice, but it didn't do too bad at all. How was it? 5 to 12. 5 21. Okay. Anyway, I, I appreciate it a lot and it was this was great. So thanks very much and, and all the best with the rest of the can journey. I, can I go to bed now? <laughs> yeah. Thanks for consuming that episode. I hope you liked it. Please check us and Carl out on social media and have a look at some of the other links in the description. Oh, and if you're still watching or listening, please subscribe. It really does help. Be nice. Be happy. Be cool. <laughs>